Okay, so bear with me. It's early in the morning. Um, we're going to be talking about moose and uh, what it is. And that's me. My name is Rick or Ricardo. Call me anything you like. And you can find the slides for this talk at this URL. I don't think I've updated the O'Reilly stuff with it, but I will. So if you don't want to copy this down right now, uh, that's where you can go to get all the slides, learn everything you need to know about Moose. Okay? Done? You can just read those and take a break. No? Okay. Um, I have questions for you, actually. So is there anybody here who doesn't program in Perl? That is good. Um, is anyone here who hasn't done any Perl object-oriented code? Okay, a couple, and that's fine. Um, there's going to be parts where I'm talking about doing OO stuff in Perl, and um, I make some assumptions, but you're, you're going to be just fine. Uh, have you, done, you guys done OO in other languages? Great. Okay. Um, and uh, I used to ask at this point whether anybody in the audience was red, green, colorblind, because unfortunately still some of my slides have red and green. I don't ask that anymore because somebody says yes, and then I feel even worse. Um, I, I really want to fix it. <laughs> It's a lot of slides. Um, but don't worry, if, 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 if it does come up, I'm going to be pointing out what's going on in every slide anyway. You won't, you won't actually lose any, uh, any data. So what is Moose, right? You're here to, to hear about Moose. Um, who, who here actually knows something about what Moose is beyond it's like for object stuff? Nobody, that's great. Um, so I'm just going to tell you, Moose is it's the new black. It's great. Um, it's it's the heart of this new renaissance in Perl. Everything's about you know, what we've gotten out of Moose, and it's this game-changing tool. People have all this hype. They want to talk about what Moose is, what's Moose about, why is Moose so great? And you end up hearing all this stuff, and you get left wondering, yeah, but dude, what's Moose? Like, why do I care about this? And it's really easy to explain what Moose is. It's a toolkit for writing classes, and it's got some features kind of like mix-ins, which you might have seen in other languages. And it's got a whole bunch of stuff for validating parameters. At which point, um, you start asking yourself, who cares? Right? The CPAN has about 90,000 tools for building classes and validating data. And most of them have been around longer than 2006 or whenever this showed up. So what makes Moose actually interesting? Because it is interesting. Uh, I really, really like Moose. I think it's great. And I think it is actually a big deal for why Perl 5 is more interesting to write now than it was five or six years ago. Um, and to explain why it's interesting, I want to talk about how OO coding in Perl happens. Perl's object system is really bare bones, right? It's, it's, not this, it's not built into the language an idea of how OO works. You just get a toolkit with almost no assumptions made in it. And you use this toolkit to build your own OO, right? How do I think my objects should work. I can build them however I want because all I've got are these tinker toys. And it's really cool, right? It's, there's more than one way to do whatever you want. But the problem is this is not always actually a feature um, because everybody makes different decisions and their decisions don't always really go together. Um, so Perl is great, right? Perl lets you solve problems however you want. One of the things people who love Perl, including me, say about Perl is it matches the way I think. And, and what people often mean is not it matches the way I think, but that I can write my code the way I think, because I can write it in so many different ways. In Moose, in the Moose culture, we tack something on. We say there's more than one way to do it, but sometimes consistency is not a bad thing either. Um, the, the acronymized version of this becomes Tim Toady Bicarbonate, or Biscabinate, um, which people say more often than you'd think, given how stupid it sounds. Um, to give you an idea, of the ramifications of this toolkit system in Perl 5, I want to look at some other languages. Um, this, who can name this language? Ruby, OK. How about this? Well, this one's a, this is a gimme. This is Lisp. Um, so this, here's Ruby. And what we're doing here, by the way, is we're just building a class. This is almost the simplest class worth making. It's a class with two attributes, and you can update the attributes. And this is basically the same thing in Lisp. Uh, the, the identifying feature here being all those fingernail clippings. Um, we're just making a class with some attributes. And if we want to do it in PHP, right, nice and simple. I've written this class in PHP. It's got some member variables. Boom, there you go. Um, this, anyone name this language? This is Perl 6. 
So this is a really, really simple class built in Perl 6. It's got some attributes. Now, we want to, I want to show you what this looks like in Perl 5, a bog standard out of the box Perl 5. To implement this class, you write this. Right? This is the worst. This is the worst. Um, so there's all these toolkits to solve it. And they make this look different, sometimes better. So there's this guy, Stephen Little, and he was doing a bunch of work on Perl 6. So, you know, what does he keep seeing? He keeps writing code like this. I'm going to make a class. There I go. It's done. And what have I written? I wrote the class, its name, and its attributes. I wrote the stuff that actually matters for building this class. But he's got a job, right? And he, he's not writing code for work in Perl 6 because it's Perl 6. Um, he's got to go and write this stuff. And you can imagine that, that his soul is being ground down by writing this garbage. So he writes Moose. And he says, I want to build a way to, uh, to make classes where all you have to talk about is the essential stuff. And what we're going to see as we go through is that when you do that, you make lots of room on the slide for putting more interesting behaviors in. Uh, this is what a class looks like in Moose. It's the same kind of class we're building everywhere else. I'm pretty happy with that. And to give you, uh, to give you an idea, um, some of the savings you get, the, these are equivalent pieces of code. This code on the left uh, is literally equivalent to the code on the right. It basically compiles to the code on the right. And I mean, I know which one I'd rather read. And I know which one I'd rather write. And by the way, has anyone spotted the bug on the right-hand side? No, of course you haven't. You wouldn't even see it if it was up at you know a nice size of font. It's, it's there, by the way. Um, OK, so who here has played Dungeons & Dragons? Good, a bunch of people. Fifth edition is out this month. Uh, it's pretty good. Um, I play Dungeons and Dragons. I really like it. Uh, and there's a blog that uh, I really enjoy. It's called Jeff's Game Blog, and it's it's really awesome. And the way I tell people how awesome it is, for a long time, this image was on the front page of the blog. Uh, has anybody identified this droid? This is IG88. He tries to kill Han Solo, um, and he's he just he got a really great mind for for talking about stuff you don't normally think about. And one of the things he writes a blog post about is spell levels. All right, so even if you don't play Dungeons and Dragons, you've, you've played a video game or you've heard enough of the general pop culture to know what's going on here. Uh, wizards cast spells. Spells have different levels that tell you something about when you can learn the spell. What does this mean? What is a spell level? Well, to give you an example, here's some spells from Dungeons and Dragons. There's fireball. You cast a fireball spell, and there's this huge explosion it fills up something like 30,000 square feet, or cubic feet. It's enormous. And everything bursts into flames and people die. It's pretty awesome. And then there's flame arrow. Right? Flame arrow, you've got to have a bow, and you've got to have an arrow. And just before you shoot the arrow, it, it lights into flame. And maybe if you hit the guy, if you hit the guy, he gets burned a little bit. But they're both third level spells. So what's going on? Jeff really wants to answer this question. And he says, you know, you could say it's about the power output of the spell, which doesn't, it doesn't make any sense, right? Because it, one is clearly more powerful than the other. Or maybe it's, it's the, the power input, right? How much, how much energy is needed to cause this specific effect. But now this is not making any, this is like Star Trek technology. We want a real good explanation, scientific explanation, for how our Dungeons and Dragons spells work. And he says it's formulaic complexity. And what he means is that they figured out how to make this flame arrow thing happen. And they figured out how to make a fireball happen. The wizards who are working in their ivory towers, doing nothing but research for centuries and wearing funny hats. Um, but they haven't put that much research into Flame Arrow, because it's not as cool. So it's still pretty complicated. You want to pull this off, you've got to do all this crazy stuff. But Fireball is awesome. right? So people have been researching the hell out of this. It used to be a level 7 spell, and they've worked their way down. Um, and someday, they're going to end up with a first level Fireball, because people are still researching it like crazy. And everybody's going to have access to this crazy, powerful thing. And they're going to keep thinking um, about how this is this crazy, powerful, very complicated magic. And that's what Moose is. right? What we're going to see is that Moose is like this level one fireball um, for objects. And it gives you the ability to pull off these really powerful effects in a very simple way. The formula you have to learn to pull it off is really easy. And the effects you get are really powerful. But it turns out that the idea of having a level one fireball in your D&D game is kind of a problem. Because all these first level wizards who just got out of their computer science slash wizardry courses 
um, now have access to this really crazy ma this really crazy magic, but they still think that it's this really complicated thing. And they think it's way more complicated than it is, and they start thinking, this isn't just something I can understand, this is like magic, uh, or whatever we want to call this. And they ask these questions based on the idea that they could never understand this because it's just too complicated. Like, if I cast fireball, is it going to set metal on fire? Well, no. It's fire, right? Does fire burn metal? No. Um, is it going to hurt my friends? Yes. It's a giant explosion, okay? That's all that's going on. It's just a big, you know how fire burns and explodes? That's all it is. Okay, well, what if I also use charm? What's wrong with you, right? You're not listening. It, it's just a fireball spell. It's not magic. And the, the same thing happens w when we start talking about moose, right? People see this big, weird animal, and they say, I don't know what this is, but this is not pearl. And I don't get it, and I'm uncomfortable, and I want to go back to writing Pearl 4. And they ask these questions, like, well, what if I use moose with arrays? It, it's, I don't know. It's, you'll have moose in an array. It's just, it's just a class. And oh, well, can, I, can I localize with moose? Um, I don't know what that means. And can I use Moose to write it? OK, so look, Moose is just a Perl library. And as this goes on, um, there's going to be more and more weird stuff maybe going on that doesn't look like it's just normal Perl code. And I really, obviously, since I've spent 10 minutes on this, I really want to drive home from the beginning. All of this stuff is really actually simple. It's all comprehensible code. You can see how it all works. So do not start thinking it's crazy, weird, source filters, C, black magic going on under the hood. It's super, super straightforward stuff that's just really well put together. So when you see this weird, wonderful animal and start thinking, you know, those are not the humps you're expecting, uh, moose is just pearl. That's all it is. It's the most important, the, the most important thing I can tell you um, beyond moose and pearl today is that any code you ever see is just code. Um, and maybe this is, this is just a bromide, but, but any code that you work with can be understood. And if you ever look at it and you think it's magic, the first thing to do is go start reading its source code and realize that you already understand it. So uh, I want to demystify Moose and get past this idea that only the people who live in their ivory towers and write Lisp and Smalltalk could use features like these, because these features are now available to everybody, and they're not magic. So let's talk about object orientation. Object orientation is a great strategy for writing code. Um, it's really popular these days. It's pretty much the dominant paradigm. And I want to tell you some of the basic underpinnings of OO. This is stuff you all know, but the way I'm going to sort it out is going to set some structure for the rest of what we talk about. There are a lot of different lists of what the fundamentals of OO are. And they're all OK. This one is mine. Uh, if you get upset that I left off something you like seeing on this list, I'm sorry. Um, state. In OO code, you have state. And what that means is every object has some data associated with it. Objects are some data that they, they carry around. And if you have an object with no state, and if your objects can't have state, they're, they're not really objects. They can't have data. And objects have behavior. You can tell objects to do something. Um, the, the classic form of talking about this is you send an object a message. You send it a message and something happens. Maybe it gives you data back. Maybe it prints something to your screen. They have behavior. That's part of what defines your objects. And together, those two things organized into classes are a form of code reuse. So the, the, that's one of the main reasons we use objects. It's not just that they let us organize our ideas but they let us organize our ideas in a way that we can use over and over and over. And these are the three things that we're going to leverage with Moose to make our code awesome. So here's some code. Um, before I start talking about what's actually in this code, I'm going to talk about some things that you're not going to keep seeing in this code, like this. Uh, strict and warnings, right? Use them. Uh, certainly use strict, probably use warnings. That's a lot of space for me to waste on every slide. I'm not going to keep putting it there. Just please imagine I'm always using it. And this magic one down at the bottom. Um, when you write packages in Perl that you want to load off disk, they need to end with a true value for reasons that are stupid. But what are you going to do? Uh, I'm not going to show that on every slide. So what I am showing you on this slide is behavior. When we have behavior in classes in Perl, we call them methods. 
and they're just subroutines, right? So here's a class. This cl class represents an employee in our large multinational organization. And it's got a method called name and title that tells you the employee's name and title. How does it do it? It looks up the employee's name and the employee's title by calling those methods. It concatenates them into a string, and there you go. Couldn't be simpler. And that's all methods are in Perl, and that's all that we're going to see in Moose. And state tends to look something like this. Right. Well, our object is a hash reference, and if you call this method, which is behavior, it will either return the title, and possibly, if you provided something, uh, provided an argument, it will set the title. The, uh, the at underscore there, by the way, the, the stack full of arguments that you, you have to play with, I, I'm going to give you a little pitch. And later in the week, I'm talking about 520. Uh, Perl 520, which came out about two months ago, and we actually have subroutine signatures in Perl now, so this slide can be updated to say something like subtitle self, which is just amazing. Okay. Um, I, I'm amazed by it. We, we've caught up with Fortran. Um, and here we can have like a read-only version of, a, of state. So here's a method that just gives us something back, but you can pass it an argument, and it's not going to set anything. And how do we get this, this data onto an object? We have a constructor. Constructor in basic Perl 5 looks something like this. We get past an argument, which is a hash reference, and we put it into a new hash reference. We bless it, which means turn it into an object, and then we hand back that, the reference to the object. Okay? So this is basic stuff. This is about the only time we're going to see a lot of basic Perl 5 OO code. This is what it looks like. And if we want to reuse code, we do something like this. So we've got a new class for representing former employees. These people do not work with us for anymore for reasons we are not allowed to discuss. We just write a new class. We say our is a, like what are we? We are a kind of employee. We give it a new method called name and title. When you call this one, it calls the super class method. So it gets whatever the normal class would have said, what employee would have said. And then it, it returns that with former stuck at the end. So you know you say Bob Jones CEO. It's now going to say Bob Jones CEO former. Any questions so far? OK, now we're going to start going through it again. But now we're going to see what this looks like in Moose. So here's the code. The first thing we have to worry about is use Moose. When we say use Moose, we're just saying I'm writing a class, and I want all the stuff I need for writing my class in Moose. We name some attributes. And here we're saying this, these objects have a name, and they have a title. Names are read-only, and titles are read-write. You can't change your name, but you can change your title. It does not reflect reality, but it makes the slides convenient. Um, and then we've got this method that we talked about, behavior. And this is exactly the same code that we had before. Nothing changes. We can still call name and title, and we, get, we can still concatenate it and return it. It works exactly the same way. And how do we get this object? We call new. New is built for us. We don't need to build a constructor. You get it for free with Moose. And we say something like this. And we get back an object. And having gotten back the object, we can call methods on it. For example, we can change the title. Uh, we can demote, promote. I'm not sure what kind of movement that is. We can change this guy's title just by using the method the way you'd expect in any other Perl object. And if we try changing the employee's name, it's going to fail. And this code will die because we already declared a couple slides ago that names are read-only. So if you try changing the name, your, your Moose underlying code knows, no, 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 you can't do that, throws an exception. Methods look exactly the same. And then at the end, we've said no Moose. So no is not seen that often in Perl. No is the opposite of use. So use brings in all that stuff from Moose, and no throws it away. And the reason we do that is, is Moose has given us not just the, the ability to be a Moose class, but it has also given us, for example, has. It's imported that into our namespace. And if we don't get rid of it, some chucklehead later is going to say, employee arrow has. And in Perl, functions and methods occupy the na same namespace, and something weird is going to happen. Because it's going to call has as if it's adding an attribute. And I don't even know what's going to happen, but it's, it's not going to be good. So we want to get rid of has as soon as we're done writing the class. In reality, I don't actually write no moose. I use namespace autoclean. Uh, which does the same thing, but also gets rid of anything. Like you've imported trigonometry functions, it'll get rid of those too. Gets rid of anything else you've imported. I'm not going to show this on every slide either. 
just imagine I've always put namespace autoclean. Okay. Um, then we want to make a subclass. So we saw subclasses before. We were mucking about that at isa. Here we're just going to say this class uses moose and it extends employee. So it's a subclass of employee. And we can write the method exactly the same way. This is exactly the same code as before. And it'll, it's fine. It'll work. I would never write this if I was writing a moose subclass. Instead, I would write this. And there's a couple little changes here. The first one is, instead of saying sub name and title, I'm saying override name and title. And that means it's asserting that there has to be a method called name and title in the parent class. If there isn't, it's going to tell me you can't override it. There's nothing to override. Um, the reason I do this is that I, I typo this kind of stuff all the time, and I've added this, the subclass method, the specialized method, and it's not getting called. And I'm like losing my mind. Why is it not calling this? Well, it's because I called it, you know, name in title. And, you know, so this is going to solve that. The other thing you can do is uh, instead of calling arrow super arrow, well, I'll show you. Instead of calling this guy arrow super colon colon name and title, we just say super. Um, first of all, it's easier to look at and easier to, uh, to write. Secondly, there are some weirdo bugs with super colon colon in Perl. If you have not encountered them, you have led a charmed life, and you should be thankful. Uh, this will not have those problems. And there's one more change. Is, can anybody spot the other change? By the way, it's a, it's a good one. It's, it's, it's kind of tricky, though. Right there. Because we're not writing a named subroutine anymore, we're calling a function called override. And we're passing an anonymous function to it. And that means we, it's, a, it's a function call. We have to end it with a semicolon. If you forget that semicolon, you get really weird syntax errors. And you're going to forget that semicolon all the time. So don't try to remember to write the semicolon because it's not going to work. Just remember, if you're writing this code and you see a really weird error from the syntax checker, just go look for where you forgot the semicolon. OK, so let's, let's talk about these. Has, like, a lot of the next two and a half hours is going to be me talking about has. Has, I don't want to talk about this. Has is adding a slot for state. It's saying, I need to store something in this object. You don't need to worry about how this object is being stored, but dear Moose, please make room for these two attributes. We used to have methods like these. Right? The title, which lets us set or get, and name, which just gets. And these get built for free by this. We've said that we want a read-only datum and a read-write one. And it's going to make methods for us. We've said you should be able to read it, so there's going to be a reader. And we've said you should be able to read-write it, so there's going to be what we call an accessor. So this invocation of has is exactly the same as this one. Right? I want a, an attribute called name with a reader called name and an attribute called title with an accessor called title. So what's going on here? These arguments to the thing setting up state also set up behavior. So I want a reader. A reader is a kind of method that gives a certain kind of behavior to our object that lets you read an attribute. And an accessor lets you access the attribute for both reading and writing. If we wanted to be more like Java-like or follow uh, Damien's Perl best practices, we could have written this. So we have an attribute called name, but its reader is called get name. And we've got another attribute called title with a reader and a writer with different names. Writer is another kind of behavior. We're going to see lots of kinds of behavior we can build onto our attributes. It's going to be really, really cool, I promise. Um, so what we're doing is we're getting the same attributes, right? the same slots in our object with different behavior built around them. We can also add more stuff to has. So for example, we've got these guys that give us our, our attributes. These are the original ones we had. And we could put things like types on our objects. So here, we need to have a name. And the name needs to be a string. And there needs to be a title. And that needs to be a string. And what happens is, if someone tries calling this code, it's going to work. It's fine. But you haven't been working on the HR code for a while. You haven't been thinking about the employees and how they work. You've been working on some other code that's storing everything as uh, an array wrap of first name, last name. And so you try writing code like this and you pass in this array ref. But your class knows that the name needs to be a string. The moose is going to catch your error, and it's really helpfully going to tell you exactly what you need to know, which is this. You're going to look at this, and you're going to say, why am I using moose? 
It's the worst thing ever. Um, Moose loves generating these huge stack trees. Moose, uh, by the way, expands to uh, meta object oriented stack trace emitter. Uh, it's mostly what it does. It helps you write classes, but mostly it emits these. Uh, you get used to these very quickly because mostly you need to look at the ends. And if you look at the ends, what it's telling you is you try to give me this array ref for a name, but I want a string. And here's where you did it. So despite all the stack traciness, the errors that you get are really, really useful. It tells you exactly what you did, where you did it wrong, and it catches the error. You know, if you had written this in normal Perl, you probably would have forgotten to put that constraint in there, and you wouldn't found out anything until you cut a payroll check to somebody named Array Peren OX Dead Beef. And I don't, even, I don't know if their bank's going to honor that. Um, so one more thing, one more thing we can do before we start moving on to the next bit. Um, we can throw this on here and say that attributes are required. Because without that, you could say this. You could say, I want an employee with this name. And it would say, that's great. That's no problem. Um, because they don't have a title. But we want a title. So we're going to actually say these are required attributes. And then when you try saying you've got a guy with a name and no title, it's going to throw an exception. And it's going to say, you can't. You can't do this. The guy needs to have a title. Sometimes you don't want to have to worry about a title. For example, your ex-employees, or if you're instantiating an object of some guy you fired, uh, maybe you don't care about what his title was. So you can go in and say, I want to specialize this attribute in the subclass. So just like override lets you specialize or change the method in the subclass, this has plus, I want to, to add something to the definition of title in my subclass, that's going to let you add something like a default. And a default is the value you get if there was no value. So if you tried making this guy as a former employee with no title, it's going to work. And when you ask for his name and title, it's just going to give you team member. That was the default we set up. OK, so let's just very quickly go over attributes again. You can say that they're read only and read write. You're going to use that all the time. That's like the default thing you do in an attribute. You just pick one of those, and then you can move on. You can give them all kinds of behaviors, like accessors, readers, writers and type constraints by saying it has to be like an integer or a string. You can say whether or not they're required. You want to build a class, use Moose. You want to make a subclass, use extends. And over, oh, <laughs> where are my bullets? Um, override and plus adder are going to let you specialize the methods and the attributes in the subclass. So any questions on all this stuff so far? This is like the absolute fundamentals we need to, to talk about anything else. Yes, you can put a default. The question is, can you put a default value in the base class, in the original class? Absolutely. Um, I almost always have defaults uh, if they are, if they are, make sense. You can have a default in the base class, absolutely. Anybody else? OK. So the next thing I want to talk about is this idea of things being set and unset, which it tricks people up a little bit in the beginning. It's a little weird, but it's important, and it's pretty easy once you get your head around it. So we talked about having things that were required. It's required. It's got to have a value. Uh, and the confusion comes from the idea of what this means. It's got to have a value. So imagine we're writing some networking code. And the network socket needs to have a port, right? because we're connecting to some remote port. And you've got to give it a port. You can't have a socket without one. So you say that it's required. And if you try doing this, making a network socket with no port, it's going to barf. It's going to say, you can't do that. Um, the network socket needs to have a port. And so your, you know, your Wiseacre coworker writes this. OK, I'll give you a port. Port's undef. And that's going to work. And you don't want that to work because it's, it's not useful. It doesn't really have a port in the way that we want to think about it. What do you mean you, ha you have a port? It doesn't have a port. It's undefined. There's no port. Um, what you need to think about is hashes. Right? If we had a hash like this and we want to see whether foo is there, we could naively start by saying if hash foo. And that's going to work because the value of foo is 1, and 1 is true. But bar is, is not going to work. Right? Because 0 is false. If you tried saying if hash bar, you get false. You'd have to use defined. And defined is not going to help for baz. There's an entry for baz. It's just undef. 
you'd have to use exists. If you want to test for an entry in a hash that has an undefined value, use exist, and that's what required is all about. Required is a way of saying there has to exist a value, even an undef value. What we actually want is a defined value. So we want to limit to the kind of value that we want, and that means we want a type constraint. So we can take that required one and swap in the type of this value has to be defined. But this swaps around our problem, because now the first one is going to work. Because it's OK, there's no value that is not defined. Arr! So you need to use both. These are cross-cutting concerns. Right? Required says, does there have to be a value? Does, a val does an entry have to exist? And the type says, if there is an entry, what values are OK? Limit the domain. And this, this will really do what we want. Uh, we could even do better than this. We could say it can't just be defined. So our type constraint there is defined. It has to be, say, value. Uh, the difference here is value means can't be a reference. We're going to talk a lot more about what the type constraints are. But this is going to prevent somebody from passing in a port that's you know, a reference to a subroutine that returns the port. No, no. It's got to be a simple scalar. Um, and this can lead to another kind of confusion, this idea of set and unset. Stepped on gum here. Um, so we've got this, go back to our employees. And our employees might have expense accounts. Expense accounts are numbers. Give us the number of the account they're allowed to draw on. And later, we're going to do some validation on whether an employee can do something based on whether they have an account. So we could say, if the employee has a defined expense account, and this all seems like it makes sense, if there's a value there, it's either going to be uh, an integer or nothing. There's no way to have any other thing. So if it's defined, we know they have an expense account and we're good. And here's the problem. We make an employee, we've hired this guy, and we give him a nice high-paying job and an expense account. He can go buy whatever he wants. And he's, he's, he's terrible, right? He ruins the company. And we say, well, we can't fire the guy because he's the CEO's nephew, but we can bust him down. So we do this. Right? We change his title and we take away his expense account. But this doesn't work. And why did, who, anybody, why doesn't this work? It doesn't work because this line comes into conflict with this type constraint. Right, we said that anything you set has to be an integer. Undef is not an integer, so you can't set it to an integer. But we know that it's OK to have no value, but how do we make that happen? It's not setting it to undef, and it's not like passing no value here to expense account, because then it's, then it's a reader. We need something else. And what we need is a method that, that clears the value. It's like the hash equivalent of a delete. And those are called clearers. So just like we could build a reader and a writer and an accessor, give them whatever name we want, we can build a clearer. And a clearer just destroys the value in that attribute. So now, oh, we can also, there's another one we can add. We can add a predicate. And if clearer is like delete on a hash, predicate is like exists. It tells you whether that attribute has been set, even if it's to undef. So we could go back to our code, for example, and have this thing which is fine, this code is OK, that says, is the ex expense account defined? We could replace it with, is it set? It's not going to work any better, given the definition we have, but it's a lot clearer when you read it. You don't have to worry about what does definedness mean about the expense account. We're just saying, if, if this employee has an expense account, nice and straightforward. We can use the idea of clearers and uh, defaults and definedness to start implementing some really cool stuff. For example, our employees are going to have a salary. And we want to be able to compute the salary based on some salary package that does uh, these big complicated calculations that we don't want, to, don't want to think about and don't want to do too often, like how long has the person worked here? What's their title? How do they get along with the CEO? Who are they related to? You know, all the important stuff. And it's an important calculation, but it's also an expensive calculation. We don't want to do it if we don't have to. So we could do something like this. We could say, they've got a salary, um, but we're putting it in a private attribute. Now that underscore at the beginning, that doesn't do anything magical. It's just like the rest of Perl. It's a little note for everybody else to say, don't, don't mess with this unless you're really part of the, the library itself. And then instead of giving it a public reader called salary with no underscore, we write a new method. And 
the new method says if there is a private salary defined, then return that. So that's our cached version. This is, this is the moose equivalent of what some people call the orcish maneuver. Give, give the, the value or, or put it in a cache. If they don't have a salary yet, then compute the salary and store it in the attribute. So what we've done is we've implemented a little cache. Or uh, if you like functional programming, we have made this lazy. We only evaluate the value for this attribute when it is asked for. If you never call salary on this employee object, we're never going to compute it. But as soon as you do, we will compute it, and we're going to store it in underscore salary. And then the next time you call the salary method, we're going to give you the stored version. This is such a useful pattern to defer unneeded work that's built right into Moose. What you do is you can say, here's the default value. And the default value here, uh, before we saw it was a string. Here we're going to put a subroutine. And when you need the default, when you're building the object, it calls that subroutine and stores the value of that. This is not sufficient. If you did this, as soon as you instantiated the object, as soon as you made the employee, we calculate his salary. The other thing you need to do is say, I have this salary attribute. Here's how you compute it. And it is lazy. So change the reader on this to only compute the value the first time you ask for it. This is crazy useful. It, makes, it can make your code crazy fast. Um, if you have a lazy attribute, it's got to have a default. Uh, otherwise, it, you might get to a point where you ask for it, and there's nothing to return and nothing to put in the cache. And I, I don't know what would, that would mean. It's bad, so you can't do it. Um, another thing you could do is instead of putting it in a default right there, in line, in your has definition, instead of using default, you could say that there is a builder. And it would look like this. And a builder is exactly like a default. But instead of being a code reference, it's a method name. So when you need the salary, when you need to compute it, it's going to call the build salary method. It does the same thing, but it's, I think it's easier to read. Uh, but more, more obviously important, or more objectively important, you can then subclass and override that method other places. Instead of having to try and change the default in a specialized plus adder, that's a mess. So this is great. This is really, really great. But what's the next problem? Because there's always a next problem. The next problem is you've got this guy. And uh, too many builds in this slide. And he starts off with this great position, and he makes a ton of money. But we demote him too. He, he also turns out to be no good. And we bust him down, and we put him in the basement office. But if we do this, his salary is going to stay the same. Because his salary got cached when we called arrow salary. And now it's sitting in that underscore salary attribute. This is no good. Right? We don't want to keep paying this guy $500,000 while he's a janitor. I mean, it's a living wage, I guess. But um, we need to use something like this clearer right? so we can clear the guy's salary. And that way, we're not, we're not resetting his salary. We're not recomputing his salary, which is expensive. And we don't want to have to do it if we don't have to. We're just saying the next time someone asks for it, compute it anew. So we've got a clearer, and it's going to delete. All right, it's going to act just like delete and blow that value away. It works just like this. This is how the lazy implementation of attributes works. It starts off by saying, well, give the cached version if you have one, otherwise compute it. And when we use the clearer and clear out that attribute, it no longer has the salary. So it's going to do exactly the same thing as it did before. Now, the only thing left is to make sure the clearer gets called. Now, as we have the clear, but unless you call it and clear the guy's salary, it's not going to help that it will get recomputed. So we go back to the title. Here's this guy's title definition. And we throw one more piece of behavior onto there. And that's going to be a trigger. Right? This is nice. Whenever you change this attribute, the trigger gets called. If you change the employee's title, clear the employee's salary and recompute it the next time you need it. Yes? The question is, if you change it to the same thing, will a trigger be called? I don't know. Uh, I think it will, but uh, the semantics of triggers are that they get passed in the old and the new value. They can see both the old and the new value, so they could decide not to do that. Uh, I'm almost certain that they are called, though. Um, so 
this is just more behavior you can stick into these attribute definitions that allow these things to start interacting. You can start imagining we're building a dependency tree between our attributes and how these attributes actually interrelate. In you know, just a few lines of code here, we've set up what in traditional, Moose, uh, traditional Perl OO would be a, it would be a big pain. Um, finally, you can see that we made salary read-write. Uh, we probably want to get rid of the ability to directly change a user's salary because it's going to undercut the idea of having this lazily built default. Right? We always want the, the computer to be in charge of what you make because that'd be great. Um, so we make that read-only. Right? We, we go from read-write to read-only, and that's a good start. If someone tries calling salary with a value to set it, it's going to throw an exception. But there's still a, a, there's still a problem. There's still a way for people to bypass the, the computing of the salary. Does anybody know what it is? Well, if you don't know the salary, there's no salary set, that's when we call the builder. And if you try to change it after the builder's been called, it's going to throw an exception. But you can prevent the builder from ever needing to be called. When you construct the object, you give it a salary to start. Right? We don't want that to be possible. We want to say, you can't do this. This is not an attribute you can set on the object. It is strictly computed from the object's other properties. So we go back to the attribute definition, and we say it's got an init arg. What's the arg argument that you use in the initializer? Normally, it's, like, it's the same as the attribute name. That's the default. And if we wanted like, to make things a little more explicit, we could say, you know, this is the yearly salary. So whenever you ask for it, you check salary. But when you build the object, you say yearly salary. But we can also just say it's undef. There is no argument. You can't start this in the initializer. So this is really important. You want to have attributes that are strictly computed. You need to make them read-only and have no init arg. The init arg name, by the way, comes from Lisp's uh, common Lisp object system, which is where a lot of stuff in Moose comes from, and it's really, really cool. If you like Lisp at all, go, go learn about CLOS. OK, so that's all the stuff about set and unset. Uh, we talked about predicates and clearers which are a lot like exists and delete. And that's the way to think about them. You've got to think about these as whether these values have been exist at all in the object, as opposed to whether they're defined values, because that's a different question. Um, builders and defaults, super useful. Lazy, I didn't talk about lazy build. Lazy build is like turns on a default named predicate and clearer and builder and makes your things lazy. And I like using lazy build. I can just say, this attribute has a lazy build, and suddenly all this stuff springs into existence. I'm the only person on the Moose team who likes lazy build. Um, so I think you should use it, but maybe don't tell everybody else that I said that. Um, OK, any questions about all the, these stuff, set and unset stuff? OK, so next let's talk about methods. Um, this is our behaviors uh, and how we're going to build behaviors. So we've got a network socket, right? And a network socket's nice and simple. We've got a way to send a string and to send lines. The least interesting part for us is the actual network implementation. So let's imagine that I've written a beautiful set of TCP code that you are all in awe of because I fit it into three dots. Um, and we're just going to talk about what we can do with the methods here that, that's awesome. Um, so we've written this network socket, but my awesome implementation actually has some bugs. And so we want to, how do we fix bugs in Perl? Add more print statements. Um, this is, this is I, I love debuggers. I use debuggers a lot. But I, mean, I add print statements all the time. I love adding print statements. It makes me feel like I, a genius. I don't know. Um, and it probably shouldn't. So we're going to make a subclass of network sockets. This is our noisy network socket. And it prints stuff out all the time. So we've overridden these two methods. Uh, we overrode set, send string. And what do we do? We call the superclass method. We have the result. And then we describe the state of the client. Right? I don't know what that means. Like we print some JSON to the terminal. I don't know. But we're just adding some debugging noise. And uh, this lets us take any class we want and throw in some extra behavior. Here it's, it's adding noise in a subclass. Now this is not Moose specific. This is totally normal anything. Um, now I've introduced a huge problem here. And it's a, it's a really pearly problem. If you, this, is, this is one of those, ah, uh, pearl things. Um, the problem here is that I didn't show you the actual return values of the base methods. But let's say that they're this. Send string always returns a reply from whatever we sent. And send lines 
returns something based on the calling context. If you call the enlist context, it returns a bunch of replies. And if you call it in scalar context, then for some reason, it returns the sum of the length of all the replies. And so it's got different return values. But when we overrode those, we did this. Right? And what does that mean? We've forced the supercall into scalar context. So we busted it. If anybody calls this in list context, it's going to act like it was called in scalar context. Because the real method, the base class method, is getting called in scalar context. We're not preserving context. Now, we could fix this a lot of ways. Like, we could just preserve context. We could have overridden all of our methods like this. Um, where, well, if the subclass version is being called in list context, then call the superclass version in list context. And then, when we return, also consult the kind of context we were called in. And, you know, it's not that much code, but it's gross. And you want to do this every time you subclass anything that has, uh, has a polymorphic behavior? It's, it's garbage. Um, and the worst part of all of this is that our, our subclass here doesn't give a fig about the return value. It never uses it. It doesn't care about the input. All it wants to do is add a print statement after the method got called. Well, why don't we just say that? After you call this method, here's some code to run. Now, you can do this. This is called a method modifier. This will not be able to see the arguments. Uh, or it's not, it can't mess with the arguments. It can't do anything with the return value. It doesn't affect anything. It just gets called between the time that the method ran and the value gets returned. It does not affect, for example, context. So we can just throw this onto both of those methods. In our noisy network socket, after you call either of these methods, dump out some debugging information. In, in fact, since these method modifiers are exactly the same, well, let's just do this. We're going to attach the same advice, that's what we call the subroutine, the same advice to both of these methods. Now, if we wanted to go a, like a step too far, which we probably do because we're Perl programmers, um, we could write it like this. I want to apply advice to any method that starts with send. It's not always as crazy as it looks. Um, if you are in control of all your code, right? you own all the code soup to nuts, you can do this and get really, really great effect from it. Um, and of course, if you want to have something run after the method, why not before? That works too. You know, before you start calling the actual method, please call this. So let's describe it before and after. Um, and there's other modifiers as well. So here's our send string. Send string is going to uh, send stuff over the network and return a reply. And we want to log what we got back. So now our, our noisy network socket is not just going to tell us the client's state, but also start talking about the response we got back. Now, we can't use before or after here, because the response we get back is the return value. So we're a lot closer to having to do that, um, that overrides thing and call super and so on. Um, we could do it that way, but we could also use around. And around modifies at both ends. So we get past not the normal self and all the arguments to the method. We get past that as well, but stuck ahead of that is a reference to the method we were about to call anyway. And then we can do whatever we want. We can call the original method, and then we can, uh, we can do whatever we want again, and we can return the reply. Now, at this point, you do have to track context. So we're back to that problem of having to worry about the return values context. There's some methods for handling this on the CPAN, but they're, they're not going to make it a whole lot better. So the real lesson here is, if you can avoid having to use override or around and can write your code in terms of before and after, which you can do a surprising amount of the time, do that. But the reason you might want to use something like around is beyond just adding print statements, which is most of the code I write these days is just adding print statements to code already written. Um, let's say you've got something that, that mucks about with HTML. And it gets past an HTML tree object. And that's fine, but most of the time you're working with strings of HTML, and you don't want to keep building this HTML to call this. So what we're going to do is make a subclass of our HTML munger, and 
it's going to take care of that transformation for us. So we're going to put some advice around that method. And in this version, we get past the HTML string. We also start with the method we were going to call anyway. The orig there right, is pointing back to this munge HTML. And what do we do in our subclass? Well, first we take the string, we turn it into an object, then we pass it to the original method, then we actually munge the tree, and then we return the string back. Right? Really, really nice stuff. One last thing to talk about with method modifiers. Um, we can combine them with methods that we get from attributes. Um, okay, so the employee class, hopefully you all still remember the employee class, um, we had this problem where if we changed the title, we had to clear the salary. It can get worse, it can always get worse. For example, we're gonna have this pay grade. Employees have a pay grade. And the pay grade is computed based on the salary. A person makes you know, $150,000, that means they're a grade L. Uh, and we compute that and we cash it, just like we computed the salary and cashed that. Well, we can't just use a trigger. We had the trigger to clear the salary when the title changed. But triggers don't fire when you clear an attribute. They only fire when you set an attribute. I have no defense to offer. It's just the way it works. But we need this to happen. When, when you clear the salary, we need to clear the pay grade. So what do we do? Well, we know that salary has a method associated with it called clear salary. So we can just say, after you finish clearing the salary, also clear the pay grade. And it works. Because clear salary, even though you didn't ever write sub clear salary, there's no place that you have written that method, it really just is a method. All the methods that come from has, the readers, the writers, the predicates, the clearers, all of those are just methods. And you can apply method modifiers to them just like you could anything else. Which again starts letting you have all of your behavior interoperate in really, really simple ways. Or rather, it lets them operate in complicated ways with you writing simple code to make it happen. So these method modifiers uh, include after and before, which are great because they let you attach behavior without worrying about interfering with the operation of the original method, uh, and around for when you do want to interfere with the original method. You can modify a bunch of things at once by passing an array ref instead of a, a single name. You can use uh, a regex if you're feeling, feeling lucky. Um, that's all I want to say about method modifiers for right now. Any questions about those? Okay. So we've talked so far about our state on our objects, our attributes, and we've talked about behavior. But the other thing that we had in, in my original big list was reuse, reusing code. And this is a big deal. Um, I do not like writing the same code twice. I write a lot of libraries for reusing my code. And one of the great things about object-oriented code is it lets you separate things into well-encapsulated concerns that can be reused more easily. And Moose like, multiplies the, the value of this with a couple techniques that it adds. So I want to talk about how Moose adds new kinds of code reuse to what you're used to. So we've got this network so socket, and we've got a subclass for making it noisy. And there's another socket uh, subclass that I didn't show you, you can imagine, for SSL. And what if we want both, right? We want to debug an SSL connection. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look like this. The OO experts in the off, uh, audience are people who, who knew this slide was coming and were still sad when they saw it because we've entered the realm of multiple inheritance. Um, multiple inheritance is the worst. And you can do it in Moose. You can have code in Moose that does multiple inheritance. But and, and with method modifiers, it can be a lot less painful because instead of having to like figure out superclass calling, you can just throw on before and after, and that's fine. But basically, it doesn't matter because nobody writes multiply inheriting code in Moose. Nobody. Um, because you won't need to. Because in Moose, we have roles. Um, anybody here use roles in any way? One person. And what if, I, what if I call them traits? Does that help? Yes? OK, one more. Um, Traits are what everybody else in the world call this thing. We are, we are the, roles is like the inch uh, of, of the metric system. We are not using some special crazy thing that we invented. They're just traits. 
Uh, but if you don't know what traits are, this doesn't help. So I want to tell you what they are. And I'm going to keep calling them roles because I'm talking about Moose. I'm not talking about what the rest of the world uses. Um, basically, roles are like a big fat include statement. But, but don't panic because it's not exactly the same. It's actually like that, but way better. So imagine we've written some code for a logger. We've got some object that we're going to use for logging error messages, something like that. And you, know, you can imagine what it looks like. There's, uh, there's a method to send a log, and it says, I'm going to actually send this log uh, to spit out if the log level is high enough. And that means I need a log level, which is some read-write integer, and that's it. And what you'll see is at the top, instead of saying use moose, I said use moose role. And here at the bottom, I've said no moose role. And what that tells us is that this is not a class. It's a role. Well, OK, great, but what does that mean? We can't call new on it. You can't make a new logger. And you can't subclass it, because it's not a class. It's just a hunk of behavior and, and state. So what does that mean? What can we do with it? Well, let's say that we've got a class, and we want that class to be able to log stuff. So any kind of object here, you call some method, and it should log something. And we want to be able to reuse this logging behavior. So we've put it into a role, which is how we reuse code in Moose. How do we get it in there? Uh, we include it, and we do that with with. So with says, I've got some role, and I want to include it in my class. And it basically means that the class looks like this. It's as if you had written the code that's in the role in the class. And everything that you had in the role it basically shows up. And you can do anything you could have done if you had written it right in the class file, including stuff like this. You can apply method modifiers to the methods in your class that came from a role. You can specialize the attributes. So you know, the level was an attribute that came from the role. And here, we're treating it the same way we treated methods that were coming from a base class. We're just saying, I've, I've already got a level. It's been defined. But I want to add a default to it. Or I want to change the default to 3. That's what my default is. And there's one more really, really important thing that we can put in a role. Um, let's say we've got this role. <clears throat> this used to say say message, which is just going to print to spit out. That kind of stinks. We want it to, to send to something else, something abstracted. So it's going to call the emit method. But if we wrote an emit method in here, then it wouldn't be abstracted anymore. You know, it might as well just be printed to spit out or whatever it is. We want to say whenever you consume this role, that's the word we use. We don't actually say include. When you consume this role, you can pick how log messages are going to be logged. And you have to, in fact. You can't leave this not, not, uh, not implemented. So the role itself will say, consuming this requires that you, the class, provide an emit method. So you give me an emit method. I will give you a log and a level. And then when we compose this role, it's kind of like not only we wrote this, but also we wrote something like that. If you try to, to use this class without providing emit, you will get a compile time exception saying, I can't actually build the class you asked for because your roles require methods that you have forgotten to implement. You can put as many roles as you want into a class. So maybe we're not just having a logger. We also have a reporter for sending error reports. And we have a socket for sending stuff over the network. And what, what happens when we want to send an error report? We use the send method. And we use that on the socket method too. And now we've got a problem. So what happens? First, let's talk about what happens anywhere else. If we were using multiple inheritance, I think these problems are pretty well known. Um, only one of those two methods would get called. Yes, you can easily figure out which one by going and inheriting the, and examining the shape of the inheritance tree. That stinks. And you could try to have the base class disambiguate between them in some way, but that also stinks. It's a big, hot mess. And the worst problem about that big, hot mess is that you won't notice the problem until runtime when someone calls the method and either the right or the wrong thing happens. Um, if you're using mixins, the same thing. Right? Basically, the same thing happens. Mixins are somewhere between inheritance and roles, um, but they're, they're grossly inferior to roles. In roles, here's what happens. You don't actually, we're not actually taking these roles and applying them to our class. With roles, 
we take the roles and we build them into one composite role. And that is what we apply to the class. And if there is any conflict while building that composite role, it's not going to, it's not going to compose. At compile time, it's going to say, no, 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 no. You tried building, you tried putting together two roles that have conflicting methods. You can't do that. And it's going to crash at compile time and you need to fix it. Now, how do you fix it? One way is you can go in and you can start saying, okay, well, I'm going to bring this role in, but I, I want to, uh, change the name of this method and stop requiring this other thing and just don't, I don't even want you to look at that because it's terrible. Like the facility is there only to give you a way to show that you are strong and you will not use that facility. It's bad. Um, they're like include, right? Um, they're like include, but they can make demands. And you can exclude and rename stuff, but the stuff that you're excluding and renaming, renaming are strings, right? You're not filtering the source code. Um, they're not strings, they're code. You're not filtering the source code. You're mucking about with these meta objects that are coming in, these subroutine objects. And you have a record of what stuff you brought in. So if you were using pound include, right, in the C preprocessor, did you know there's a switch to Perl that tells it to run your code through the C preprocessor? Don't, don't do that. Um, if you did that, you wouldn't know what came from where, because it really would just be, I've stuck some files together and I've run it. Um, here, we've, got, we, we've kept receipts, right? Yes, class has a log method, which it got from this role. And this is a really big deal, because not only do you know where each subroutine came from, you know, for example, which roles any given class has consumed. And this is really, really wicked important. So this is, this is what we call vertical code reuse, right? This is um, traditional isa. We've got a subclass, and it is a kind of class. And in Perl, if we want to test for that, I've got a thing. I've got, a, I've got an object. Is it, a, is it a class? Is it a kind of this class? You can just call isa, and it will it'll tell you true or false. Is it that? When we do that with roles, we start calling it horizontal code reuse, right? Because we're not stacking all these subclasses. We're taking peers and we're smooshing them together. And if you want to test for this kind of composition, and you can test with isa in, in Moose, that works. If you're testing for roles, you say does. Does this class do this role? And this is really, really powerful. So we've got our network socket, everything you've seen before. And then we're going to imagine we've got a class that represents a blob, binary large object blob. Uh, and it's going to have a method for sending itself over a socket, over a stream. And this is an easy to imagine a way that we might have written this code. You've got to first make sure that the target that you were given to send this blob to is a network socket. That's what we want to send to. And then you send to it. And this is fine. This is what you'd normally write. But this kind of sucks because the promise that is made by network socket could potentially be a really big API, right? A network socket probably has a local port and a remote port and a local adder and a peer adder and uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. All this stuff about the fact that it's a network socket. The blob doesn't care about that, right? What does a blob care about? The blob clearly only click cares that it can call send string. And we don't want the next person who comes and takes over this code to think that they can rely on stuff like peer adder, right? We don't want the, the blob to think about that. It's only about sending. So we could, instead of saying it has to be a subclass of network socket, we could say it has to provide send string. And that's okay, all right? It's, it's potentially better than isa. But you can have these, you can have that method by coincidence. Send string is a pretty reasonable name to use for all kinds of stuff. And the APIs could be different. The, the meaning of the method could be different. So how do we know that the thing I'm sending it to is meant to accept a string and send it over to some remote destination? Well, we say it has to promise to do the transmitter role. Right? So by giving it a name, we have a common handle we can use where this means you have to have this functionality with this API. Of course, that means we have to write a transmitter role. And what's the transmitter role going to look like? It's going to look like this. It's bottom box here. That's it. That's all you need to put in it. 
there's a role called transmitter, and you have to provide this method. It seems kind of like maybe I've introduced some, some busy work here, but it's not. Because the other thing that comes with this, this requirement in this name is a promise. And it's a well-known promise with a name where you can say, anything that does this role is implementing this API, and it is, it is documented somewhere. It's not just, well, if anything happens to have the methods with the right name, great. Um, that's not actually great. That's just adequate. And what we want is great. Um, if you tried putting something, um, I have a note here to myself and it doesn't make any sense. Um, if, if we try putting this role into something that doesn't meet the API, it's going to barf. And if we try using something that implements the API but doesn't explicitly promise that it's implementing the API by consuming this role, then this guy is going to throw a fit. It's going to say, no, no, you gave me something. I didn't even look at the methods because it doesn't, it doesn't implement this promise. So roles are going to work for us in two ways. They let us reuse hunks of features, right, subroutines and attributes. We write them in one role and we consume them over and over and over. But they also let us check that the classes or the objects that we're working with provide well-known promised bundles of features. So they're not just acting like a hunk of code we can reuse. They're also acting like a named interface. And um, I've, I, more than once I've had people come up to me after this talk um, or during the break and say, but interfaces are the worst. Haven't you ever written Java? Um, and that's not what this is like. It is not like a Java interface. It is something else. Um, it's, it's a way of promising an API. I can't, I, I've probably said it enough. I feel like I can't say it enough, but maybe I should stop saying it. Um, remember we added this emit requirement to our logger role? Um, it required that whatever consumed the logger provide emit. And that was going to lock you down to one kind of emitter, right? Because if you have a class and it's going to consume this role, you've got to have a method called emit. And the emitter... The thing that's doing emit, it's, it's got a method. It's got one way of emitting stuff. So you've, you've locked down your class into emitting in one way. We could have done something a lot more flexible. We could have said, when you consume the logger, instead of requiring emit, it has a required transmitter attribute. So whenever you, if, you, if you'd consumed this into your employee class, your network class, then anytime you instantiated an object, you would need to provide a transmitter to it. And now... Now we've got this thing where we can transmit, and any time we want, we could call send string on the transmitter. And how do we know that there's going to be a send string method? We have a promise for this. Right? How, how do we promise that there's going to be a send string method? With our transmitter role. So we want to make sure the transmitter is always something that this is going to work with. And we could do that by adding like a die unless self transmitter does what Dell's does transmitter. But this kind of stinks because we're not going to notice the problem until we've actually tried logging something. We want to catch it as early as possible. In this context, as early as possible means when we have when we've built the logger. So we put a type constraint on there. Remember type constraints way back in the beginning? We can put a type constraint on for a role. Say so any value that you put into this attribute has to do the transmitter role. And if it doesn't, you're going to get an exception when you build the object. So roles are these reusable bundles of code. Um, the original paper is about roles, about traits, is called Traits, Composable Units of Behavior. I do not like to recommend that people read computer science papers because they tend to be just awful. Um, that's, it's not true. They tend to be hard and boring to read. The, the paper on traits is a really good read. I, I've read it more than once. It's just good stuff, uh, and it makes you really think about how your OO code works. Roles also not just work like this. They work as named interfaces that promise to implement the interface, and they're an alternative to inheritance. When I said that you don't need to worry about multiple inheritance in Moose because people mostly don't use it, I was not exaggerating. Right? It's not like, well, only weirdos use it. Nobody, nobody uses multiple inheritance in Moose. In fact, a lot of people... Don't even use single inheritance. Uh, I wrote a very large system in Moose about two, three years ago. And it's got, 
I don't know, 100 roles and basically no classes. When, when we need a class, we just, at runtime, grab a bunch of roles, compose them, and keep going. Um, classes, I'm going to predict the future. Classes are dead. Um, the future is in this kind of composition. It has problems, but it has none of the problems of multiple inheritance, and basically none of the problems of, of single inheritance. Um, so this is the reason, this idea of these promise interfaces, that back when I said you could resolve this with this thing to rename and hide parts of your interface, that's, remember how I said not to do that? It was bad. The reason it's so bad is that you're breaking the promise. If a role is so useful because it's a named promised interface, and now you can provide that interface except you've changed the names of things or you've hidden things from it, then anytime somebody starts calling does, hey, does this object implement this interface? And you say, yeah, I sure do. And then they call the methods that you promised and they're not there, then you are a terrible person. Um, you always, if you hit this problem, it's nice, I suppose, to have the safety net. Well, I guess I'm going to have to wheel out this terrible thing. Um, if you hit this problem, it probably means you have designed something wrong. And you should just take a moment to step back and actually fix the problem. Why are you composing two things that both have a method called send? Maybe you should realize send is a pretty lousy name. Maybe you should fix it in both of them. Um, that's why this is such a red flag. So roles. They're just like include. Uh, you can have methods and modifiers and attributes and just about anything you'd put in a class. And you can require stuff of anything that consumes them. Really, really important. And they give you uh, a way to make a promise about what you're going to implement. Writing a role looks like, yes? That's a great question. So the question was, um, let me go back a bunch of slides just to show you one that has that. I don't know how many slides I need to go back. The question was, if you have a bunch of roles, does it, does it matter where the width is? Um, maybe you didn't say bunch of roles, but I'm going to talk about that anyway. Um, so I said that using width was a lot like using pound include. And it is. It's a lot like using pound include. And just like with using pound include, the position does matter. It doesn't always matter. But let's say that we had, there's a slide with the code I want to show you. Um, yeah, so we've put after here. Say after the log method call something. Well, we can do that because width has given us a log method. But if we were to move the width down below the after, then after is going to get called, and it's really friendly and tries to help us with our mistakes. And it says, da -da -da -da, you, don't have, you don't have a method called log. You can't attach a method modifier to it. So you do need to include things in the right order. Um, almost everyone puts all their roles at the very top. And that way, anything you write in the class is going to affect those. Now, it, this can get a little trickier. You tricked me into talking about some of the problems with Moose. Um, if you've got an attribute, I'll find a slide that has this. You've got an attribute that provides some behavior. Come on. Right. So, at least an attribute. So, you can imagine this attribute here. It does provide behavior. In fact, uh, it provides a reader. The transmitter attribute here provides a method called xmitter because it's a read-only attribute. And read-only attributes give you a reader with the same name as the attribute. And if you were bringing this into something to fulfill a requirement, so you have another role that requires a method called xmitter, you have to get them in the right order because you need the xmitter attributes associated behavior to be built before the roles need it. Now, at this point, it does start to sound like we're talking about something crazy and awful again. What really tends to happen is everything just works. Uh, most of the time, everything just works. If it doesn't work, the error messages that Moose gives you are actually really good. And it will say something like, hey, you're trying to add advice to a transmitter method, or you're requiring a transmitter method, and it's not there. So you go and you look at the source code, and you see, oh, right, I've included them in the wrong order, and you're fine. Um, I have not ever encountered or heard of a situation where there is a circular requirement. Um, I don't think I can contrive one off the top of my head, which is good, because it means it's probably pretty hard to make it happen. 
Yes. So actually, auto roll and auto boost, they're both on the same. And those are awesome. What about those packages you have where you can call super from inside a roll, the roll goes up and they do the roll super? Right. And does Goose kind of answer that? Yeah, so the, the, <laughs> the, the question is in some implementations of roles, if you call super from inside, from inside of a, uh, a method from a role, things go wrong because it can't figure out what the superclass is. And is there, a, is there a solution for that in Moose? And the, yes, the solution is don't do that. Um, so let me, let me ask you, why, why do you do that? Yeah, so what you would, here's what you, so the, yeah. So the explanation is um, you want to you want to be able to, to change the way this method works in your superclass in some role that you're bringing in. Um, so roles do not. In fact, this is the this is thank you because you've, you've caused me to say a, a, a catch a moose catchphrase. Um, it's kind of an obnoxious one. It's not very pithy. Uh, roles do not participate in vertical inheritance, right? So whenever you think about the the up and down the is a tree, roles have nothing to do with this. So you can't ask about the superclass. There isn't one. But what you could do, um, earlier I showed you two ways of specializing a, a method. One of them was to use override. And override is like you're writing a, a subclass method. And the other one was to use around. Most of the time, override and around are totally interchangeable. You can use, um, you can use around or override, whichever one you want, and then the the semantics of calling the other one are a little different. With override, you then say super to call the parent method. And with around, you use that dollar or ridge that we saw. Super is no good in a role because there's no parent class. But a ridge still is. So if you write a role and you need to modify a method that's coming from somewhere up the tree, you can use a ridge to get the method that was being modified or being overridden. So I, do you think that would do what you need? You should give it a go if you want to, to have a poke at it over the break. Uh, that, that's fine with me. I think that would do what you want. In fact, it's, it's an, a good reason to talk about that. To, a good place to go from that is that is one of the only reasons to consider whether to use override or around. Um, and a lot of people will tell you, I, I use both. A lot of people will tell you, and with good reason, always use around. Around always works. Around works in roles. Override works in roles unless you try calling super. Um, so I'll potentially always, maybe in fact, always use around because that way I'm making up for telling you to use lazy build. Um, any other questions? Okay. So um, this is what a role looks like. I'm sorry, this is what a class looks like. Oh, I'm sorry, I see. I skipped a slide. I thought I just made the worst mistake possible. This is what a role looks like. We say we want to use moose role. This is what a class looks like when you use a role. We bring that role in. Here you see I've brought the role on the bottom. I don't know why. And this is how you check for a role. Okay. Questions? I think I just got them all. Now, we have hit my usual break point a little early. I think probably too early to want to send you out because then you're going to, it's going to be weird for you. You're not going to be able to eat your cakes. Uh, yesterday there was no there was no pastry in the morning. It was just fruit. I was actually pretty happy about that. Um, so we got twelve. I'm going to try to shoot for one more segment before we go to break. Everybody okay with that? Okay. I don't want to I don't want to be the guy who sends you out late and there's only only bruised apples left. Um, I'm talking about type constraints. Type constraints, which we talked about just a little at the beginning. Type constraints in Moose are huge. They're like crazy important. Um, Moose types. Okay, they're not really types. Now, they're not what you'd get in, in Haskell. They're not what you'd get in ML. Uh, there's, there's no type inference. There's certainly no compile time safety. Um, it's a way to do data validation uniformly and pervasively through your code. And let's face it, that's pretty good, right? right? It's not going to give you a statically typed language, but it's still something a whole lot better than nothing. So... The usual place that you see types used in Moose is in an attribute definition. So earlier we saw is a is an int. Um, 
Here's a more complicated one. Children is an array ref of nodes. So anything you put into that value has to match that. Really, really important. But you can use them other places, and you should use them other places because the more places you use your types, the more uniformly you are validating your data. I'm sure everybody's hit that bug where you validate the data in three places, three different ways, and like that one error sneaks in from the one weird border. Uh, so if you're writing a subroutine, you can do something like this. Please assert this callback is a valid value in the code ref type. And you might have early, noticed that earlier, when I had is a int, it was in quotes, and now I've dropped the quotes. This is not a mistake. Uh, this is how we, we put types in here. Um, we tend to call these musex types, or bare word types, and there are, you could refer to this in a string, but it ends up being really gross, because the, the strings are all global namespace, and you have to worry about when you make a new type, interfering with anybody else's, and the, the moose X types, the bare word types, are local. So uh, all you need to worry about is that this is not a typo, and we'll come back to what's actually going on later. So if you're only using really, really simple types, the, the global types that come with moose, that's the time I tell you to use strings. Any other time you want to use these bare words, and the global types that you get with moose are these guys. Um, I don't think most of these need explanation. You see there are a hierarchy. You get booleans, undef, strings, numbers, integers, different kinds of reference. Um, this is Perl, right? So we have not magically added a way to distinguish between strings and numbers. Um, anything, in fact, you'll see here, a number is a subtype of string. Thanks, Perl. Um, but that's right, it's, Moose is about, is about being Perlish. Moose is not about pretending to fix Perl. It's just building more Perl on top of it. It's a fractal expansion of Perl. Um, and you can put those in strings. Uh, stuff like this works. That's about as far as I'd go. If we want more complicated types, and we'll talk about more complicated types a little later in the afternoon, then we'd start using these bare word types. Okay, so this just works. We've got a built-in integer type. If we wanted to use the bare word version of this, we would import it from moosex types moose. Moosex types means I want to use the kind of types that don't need quotes, and moosex types moose are those kind of types that Moose itself defined, the ones from that little, that little tree I just showed you. And you could get the array ref one also, and then you'd say array ref int. And by the, just, this is where people start talking about, you know, fireballs and charm again. Um, there's no source filter. This, I mean, like, what's going on here? Like, this is some kind of weird array thing, but there's no sigil. Um, what actually should tip you off is that we've imported array ref and integer, and what do we usually import? subroutines, so it's actually more like we've done this, but if I wrote this on every slide, your eyes would bleed, so I don't. I write this. Okay, try not to think about the stupid fact that this is subroutines, which is just so gross, but it looks nice. Okay, so, so the reason that we don't write this, this would work fine, and we would maybe write this, but the problem is there's more types than the core moose types. Let's, let's say I was writing something to deal with CPAN distributions, and I wanted to validate um, a set of prerequisites. And what's the type that I'm going to use for this? Maybe it's a hash ref of strings. right? So it's got to be a hash reference, and the values have to be strings. But that kind of stinks, because it's going to let us get all kinds of garbage value through. Because uh, those things on the right, they're not just strings. They're version strings, right? If I put banana on the right-hand side, it should fail. And the things on the left, they're not just keys, not just strings. They should be package names. I will really, really want to validate that. So I can pull some stuff down from the CPAN and say the type of this is a mapping from package names to lax version strings. And then if I, tried, if I, if I accidentally forget a colon here, I get a runtime error. Or if I accidentally have too many dots over on the right-hand side, it's a runtime error. And you can't get that with these stringy types. Or if you try to get it with the stringy types, you will end up very sad. So this is the reason that we, that we succumb to this weird quoteless version. Um, this guy, by the way, remember this? We said we wanted to have a transmitter that does the transmitter role. It's just the type constraint. Saying does role name is shorthand for saying this. It is a the role type, the transmitter role. So whatever is in there has to compose the role transmitter. Okay. I want to look at some real code. This is an actual code sample from code I've written. 
Uh, it's obviously, it shows us a lot of real inner workings of Moose going on. There's a problem with this code. So it's actually not a real sample. And the reason it's not a real sample is log dispatch Julie, it's a, it's a logger class that I've written. Um, it's not a role. Okay, it's not a role. It's not even Moose. So I can't say does. I have to say is a. Now, this might work, but it's like guessing that that thing on the right is a, is a class name. It's like maybe because it's got colons in it, maybe because a package is defined. But what if I had a, a class named int, right? Then we'd be in a world of hurt. Well, do you mean it's an object of type of class int, or do you mean it's an integer? So what we'd really write is it's, it is a class type. Just like we had role type, we have class type. But this kind of sucks too, right? Because remember we had this guy, and I, I, I railed about how much I didn't like this because we're promising this huge interface forever. And what was our solution? Our solution was to use a role type and to say, this thing has to do transmitter. And now we've limited it to one named interface. So we can't come back here and say that this is going to be a role type because log dispatch really is not a role. We can't do it. So our next solution uh, was to start falling back to can. And I didn't like that. I didn't like it because we could do better. We could build a role and use a role to promise a, a whole interface by name. But we can't do that here. We can't build a role for this non-moose code. And we're not going to go re-architect our whole logging framework. We've got to suck it up. And we've got to just say, OK, this is as close as we can get to giving a specific interface. And that's what we require. In Ruby, and in some other languages now, but I think it mostly came from Ruby, people talk about, how do you know what the type of an object is? Well, you know, you check its methods. Can it quack? Can it swim? Can it fly? Yes, it's a duck. We do the same thing in Moose. So you say, this is a duck type. But instead of quacking or whatever else, we're going to say, this is a duck type for these methods. And if you tried putting an object into that attribute that didn't implement the whole interface by inspection with can, you'd get an error like this. You tried giving me a log logger, but it doesn't have this required method. It's a great error message. I wrote the code that gives this error message. So, um, One more thing to say about types, and I think we will take our break, uh, I think. We'll see how many slides I have. Let's go back to our employee class. And we want to store more vital employees information, like what's their favorite beetle? And we could use a string, but there's a limited set. So we've got a built-in type. Uh, in Moose for enumerated values that let us limit all the possible values we'll ever see. Um, let's see. And last, last word on types. Okay, so we had that send to method. And that's what we ended up doing. But what if we were using a duck type? Um, we couldn't croak like this. Now, we could, I guess, croak on can. But the duck type that I made a couple slides ago, it had a couple methods in it. So here, are we going to write, you know, Confess doesn't have this method. Confess doesn't have that method. For each one, that sucks. So like I said earlier, you want to make these types so you can reuse them everywhere, not just in attribute definitions. So we can just get our duck type and then say, this must be a valid member of that type. And the assert tells us that it's going to throw. So it's either going to do nothing or it's going to throw an exception, just like we saw before, and say, hey, you've passed me this argument, and it's not valid because it's missing the following three methods. Well, here it's just one method, okay? But like, imagine that we had a bunch of methods. Um, we could also write this. There's no reason we need to put that into a, uh, into a variable. But if we wanted to, we could, for example, put it in a state variable, and we wouldn't be rebuilding this type over and over. We could also give it a name and have this named duck type. So types. Uh, types let you limit the possible values for your attributes. And I'll take a moment to say that's really important. Um, the more possible states that your objects have, the more bugs your code has. And this is not like the more bugs your code might have. I'm pretty sure I can just say, the more possible states, the more bugs. Um, the two things you want to constrain as much as possible are you want to make as many of your attributes read-only as possible, and you want to use the tightest type definitions you can get away with, at least if you're not concerned about the cost of validation. Because if you always know the state of your object is in this limited realm, you can imagine the whole state of your program a lot more easily. So the ability to limit these possible values is huge, huge. And it lets you reuse the way that you validate them, which means you're never concerned, oh, well, over here we use backslash D for numbers, and over here we use 0 through 9 for numbers. Um, there's a bunch of core types, which are pretty good, int, array, ref, those guys. Um, 
and there's the MooseX type libraries for more stuff. These guys we saw and use types everywhere. Okay, so we got a whole bonus section in there. That means in the second half, I will not rush as much as I usually do, which is awesome. And you have 13 seconds to get to fruit. And if anybody has any questions, feel free, any questions before you go? Okay, I'm gonna stand out here and answer any questions that you didn't want everyone to hear uh, and enjoy your fruit. And be back here in half an hour, right at 11 o'clock. Yeah, thanks. I want to make a slide, because I used to have a cake slide, and there's no cake. So I said it, which is good. I'm, I'm happy with the fruit. And I learned there's no emoji for orange, which I just feel like it's a little, it's a little unfair to oranges. There's also no, there's no coffee that I could find, um, or tea. There was cups, but I think it was like a cup of sake. Let's see, let's go find it again. Oops. You're just being rude now. Ah, matcha. Awful. And there's the sake. So, you have to stick with these. <clears throat> Unless they had sake out there, I didn't see it. Okay, you got five seconds if you have to do anything before we get back started. Chop, chop. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. I'm going to start. Um, anybody come up with any good questions over the break? Okay, good. Um, so I'm actually excited because we got that extra section in before the break. Uh, I usually like zoom like crazy through some of the stuff at the end that's not really that important, but now I can potentially take a leisurely stroll through it, but it's not that important, so maybe I shouldn't. We'll see what, we'll see what happens when we get there. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is moose object. Moose colon colon object. Moose colon colon object is what your object is a when you use moose. Okay, it is the base class for basically all moose objects. And it gets you some of the behavior we've already talked about. So for example, we've got our employee class, and you can make an employee with new. Where does that new method come from? It comes from moose colon colon object. And moose object implements um, a number of other methods that are useful, some of them in sort of pedestrian ways, and some actually are really kind of cool. Um, one of the less important but very useful things is all of your objects will get a dump method. And if you print out an object's dump, you get this. So if, if like me, you debug most of your problems with print statements, this makes them a lot easier to write because I am very prone to leaving random occurrences of use data dumper throughout all of my code. Occasionally I'll like go prune my source trees. Did I leave any in? No, okay, I can push. Um, this just builds it in. And uh, note, by the way, that well, what you got here is just a hash ref. Now, I had not, for the whole first half, talked about how moose objects are stored in memory. Moose, like I said, moose tries to be just like normal Perl stuff, but better. And that means that its objects are hash refs, just like most Perl objects. But please, please, pretend I did not tell you this. Because as soon as you write code that starts dealing with the underlying storage, you're undercutting all of this cool stuff about like laziness and type constraints. Like if you deal with the references directly, you are, you're just setting yourself up for heartbreak and tears. Don't do, this is the only time you should be thinking about them as data structures is when you dump them. And when you're dumping them, you already have one bug to fix, do not add more. Okay, so dump is nice, it's handy, but it's definitely not the most useful thing you get. Here's a better one. Um, so we've got a, a moose class for errors. And by the way, I use a moose class for errors, and it's awesome. It makes it really easy to throw exceptions. And this error class, though, is a really nice, simple one. What is an error? It's a thing with a string. It's got a message. So whenever we build one, we've got to give it a message. So all of our invocations to error new look like this. 
well, that's kind of stupid. Why do we have to pass in these squiggle braces and message and an arrow every time? We know that almost every time we call this, there's just going to be the one argument. You know, the only reason it might be more is maybe in a subclass. So we can change the way that our object interprets the arguments to its initializer with this. Build args. Build args is how Moose deals with the stuff you gave to new and turns it into a hash ref of init args. Remember init args from way earlier? They come from build args. And this is a nice simple one. It's going to say, when somebody is called new, if you were only given one argument and it is a string, then act like you were given the hash ref containing message and that string is the value. Otherwise, just keep working as normal. And that means we could write either of these and they will be functionally equivalent. This is really, really nice because you can imagine there's a lot of benefits to get from Moose, uh, laziness and type constraints and all this stuff. And you might not really need complicated constructors. You know, maybe you're, you're implementing geometry, you're doing shapes or graphics, and all you need to have are corners, right? Every object gets initialized with four integers. There's no reason to start having to pass left upper four, right lower, it's, you're going to die, right? You need to have these nice compact ways. And build args makes it really, really nice and easy. There's a more interesting one that goes along with build args. Build args, as the name implies, is for building your args. There's also build, and that's for building everything. And build goes along with demolish. Build and demolish are run when you build the object and when the object is destroyed. So like, like destroy, it is a destructor. It gets called uh, automatically when the object is garbage collected. And <clears throat> the interesting thing about them is how they work. They, uh, they're implementing what we sometimes call sub-methods, where you don't need to call super. You don't need to make sure that they're called in a specific order. Moose does that for you. For example, when you're building a new object, and the object is of class sub-sub, first it calls build in the base class. Then it calls build in the subclass. And then it calls build in the lowest class. So it starts with the most generic class and works its way down to the most specific, calling build on each one. And like I said, the builds don't need to call each other. They all get called independently. And demolish is the same kind of thing, but it works in reverse. First it calls the most specific, and then it works its way back up. Now, <clears throat> demolish is useful for limited circumstances, right? Like you're doing a graceful shutdown of resources, or you're cleaning up uh, a mess that you know your objects make when they're working. And so that's why they're going to work in this most specific to least specific way, because the least specific thing might close database handles, uh, you know, up in class, these globally managed resources, that might need to get used by the cleanup and the more specific stuff. It's interesting that you can do this, but I will tell you that in eight years of writing Moose code, I'm not sure I've ever written a demolish. And if I have, I've written it infrequently enough that I can't even remember ever writing a demolish. Know that it's there, um, but mostly we're going to talk about build, because build is super useful. One thing we can do with build is complex validation of state, things you can't just do with a single type constraint. So it's time for our company to go online, and all of our employees are now going to get usernames and email addresses. And we can compute one from the other, right? If we know your email address, your username is the bit before the at sign. And if you know your username, your email address is a username with a domain appended. And we can compute one from the other if you give us just one. But there's a problem, right? If you don't give us either one, that's no good. We can't compute anything. And you give us both, they might conflict. So the first thing we need to do is write a method that validates the object that we have. And it might look something like this. Um, <clears throat> if you didn't give us either a username or an email, we're just checking predicates. We have neither of these. Neither has been set at all. That's no good. Throw an exception. Confess, it just throws an exception to the stack trace. Um, if you can get a stack trace in Moose, get a stack trace. They're the best. Um, and the next one is going to do some kind of check to make sure they match, which is basically, you know, does the email address look like the username plus the domain? That's fine. But now we need to call this. And we need to call it as soon as possible. 
If you give us a bad set of data to initialize our employee, we want to die as early as possible, crash early, right? That's, that's a great philosophy. And the way we do that is we put it in build. So after new has finished, but before it has returned, we're gonna call build, and it's gonna sanity check the username. So it's going to look like new doesn't work if you give it bad data, which is exactly what you want. You try building an object that is not valid, and before the object gets assigned into you know, dollar employee, you're gonna have an exception thrown. Because we put it in its own method, sanity check username, you can call it from other places, right? Like if, uh, if someone is going to change the username, we can call a trigger, and the trigger can sanity check. So <clears throat> the build lets us do this complex validation, and putting a complex validation in its own method makes it reusable, and code reuse is our favorite thing. Um, there are other interesting things that show up, like here's, here's a nice bug. We've got a network client, and how does it work? Well, it's gonna to connect to a host, and by default, it connects to the host from the config file. And how does it get the config? Well, it calls self-config, and self-config comes from some any file. Okay, so we parse this any file, it gives us back data, and then we get the host name, and that's what we connect to. And this is okay, and I'm just gonna tell you up front, there is no trick, you know, we're imagining a, an any file that contains all the right data, it's syntactically correct, in fact, when we, when we use this class, sometimes it works, maybe half the time. Half the time, though, this happens. And it can't use an undefined value as a hash reference, and we're thinking, what's, what's going on? Right? It, it worked last time I ran it, I haven't changed the code. So we go back and we look at the code, and we follow up on the stack trace. See, stack trace helps out, and it tells us that this is the problem. And we're trying to use undef, as a hash reference. And the thing we're trying to use as a hash reference is config, clearly. So what happened? Well, what happened is, sometimes this happens. We initialize config, then we initialize hostname, and everything is fine, right? We load up the any file, and then we get the hostname out of it, and our program runs. Other times, we try to initialize hostname, but config hasn't been initialized yet. So when we call config, it's undefined. The order in which we initialize these attributes is not defined. Uh, I believe it is strictly the same as the order they come out of the hash, and the order that things come out of the hash in Perl is basically random, it's pseudo-random. Um, so you can't rely on it. And this is relying on it. This is relying on the fact that config will be initialized before hostname is initialized. It doesn't work that way. So how do we fix it? Well, one thing we can do is we can go in and we can mark hostname lazy, right? And that means we're not gonna try and get the hostname until somebody asks, asks for it, but we know that we're gonna get config as soon as we build the object. So config is always read, later someone will call hostname, and then we'll pull a thing out, and that works, and that's great. But there's two problem cases to care about here. Um, one of them is, what if we do this? We add some host IP, and the host IP gets a default by resolving the host name. And we didn't mark that one lazy. So what's gonna happen? During initialization, host IP is gonna call host name, causing the builder to run, right? It's, it, the laziness has been, has been met, it's decided it is time for me to work, and one third of the time, it will not have uh, initialized config yet. Half of the time, I guess. I don't know. Let's not worry about it. Some fraction of the time. It's a bug you're only going to see sometimes and is therefore the worst kind of bug. So that's pretty bad. And you could fix this by making host IP lazy. And then anything else that depends on any of these, you'd have this sort of laziness that you have to manually keep track of. So the next problem, we're not adding this laziness to be efficient. We're adding the laziness to ensure that things get done in the right order. Right? We've made hostname lazy so that config gets built first. <clears throat> the downside is we've got these type constraints, right? Like the hostname needs to be a valid hostname. The IP address needs to be a valid IP address. And if someone puts in the config file hostname123, uh, right, or, or a bunch of Unicode characters, something that is not a valid hostname according to our type, we're not gonna find out about that until someone tries to connect to it or resolve it. 
until the host name's builder is called, because it's lazy. It can't type check it until it computes the default. And we want to crash early. We want that type constraint to get triggered as, as soon, the, the, yeah, the, the default to be triggered as soon as possible so the type check can happen as soon as possible so we can crash as soon as possible and fix the bug before it's in production. We didn't add the laziness to be efficient and avoid work. We added laziness to make things work at all. So how do we make sure we crash early? Well, we can just go to build. And we can call the readers there. And because they're all lazy, they will call in the correct order. Right? The first one that you call will call anything it needs to call, and they'll all sort of cascade through calling. But since it's in build, it happens as soon as we initialize the object. So this way, you're getting the benefits of laziness for dependency computation. And you're not doing any computation. You're just marking things lazy. But you're not getting the hit of having type checking happen too late. So you get to have your cake and eat it too, or your fruit in the case of today. Um, this, is, this is the other reason we use build. So these, these guys from Moose Object, dump, pretty useful. Build args, pretty useful. Demolish, uh, sometimes useful. I don't know. I've used it. Never, I don't know. And build. Build, 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 build. Build is really useful. Use build all the time. It always starts with the most base class so that the, the subclassing classes can rely on the promises of the base class already having been fulfilled. It works its way down. You can use it for these complex type constraints where multiple attributes need to match together. And you can use it for dealing with this laziness problem, this problem of dependency between your attributes. It's another kind of uh, of complex constraints on your data. Any questions on the, on these guys? Right. So the question was, <clears throat> why didn't I use build to call config? Um, so the reason I didn't use build to call config, I think there is one. Well. Yeah, so you can. I could use build to call config. But I know that hostname is going to call config. So it doesn't really get me anything. Um, it would be totally reasonable to do it. I've also, config is not lazy in what I've done. Uh, config didn't need to be lazy. Because if everything else is lazy, then conf we know config will get called before everything else. If I made config lazy, I might want to call it first, just to make sure that I see that I've made sure it gets called. But in an example this simple, I could also rely on the fact that I know hostname will cause it to get called. But since it's not lazy, there's no need. OK, uh, anything else on, on that subject before we move on to types? OK, so next we're going to talk about making our own types, which is great. The, the types that come with Moose are pretty good. I mean, I, I probably use them about half, maybe more than half the time. So this, is, this has to be a number. This has to be a string. That's, it's often good enough. But when it's not good enough, it's really not good enough. And you really need something better. <clears throat> and a lot of people, their first instinct is not to make new types, but to start adding one-off code like into build or adding code into their methods that does this validation. And you can do that, because making types is a little weird. Um, but you lose all those benefits of types, the, the reusability of the types and the ubiquity of the single definition. Um, and there's other features we're going get, to get out of types that you won't be able to get if you're doing this stuff all one-off. So even though defining types is weird, I think it's important to cover it and to convince everyone how great it is. There's two ways to do it. Um, one is to use these stringy types. You can define your own stringy types. I'm not going to talk about how to do it, because you shouldn't do it. Uh, it's not any better. It's just weirder. Maybe it's not weirder. It's weird, and it's, it leads to problems that we discussed, namespace collisions, for example. <clears throat> Most of the time, you want to write your own Moose X types. Moose X types are the ones we wrote without the quotes. So let's get down to it. Right? Let's not just talk about why they're weird. Here's our network socket. Earlier, we defined addresses as strings and ports as integers. Right? And like, that's OK. The address here we're going to imagine is an IP address, not a host name. <clears throat> and string is a pretty lousy type constraint for an IP address. An IP address. I need to sneeze, and it's just not happening. Um, an IP address has a really, really specific set of constraints. Over and above, it's got to be a string. And we want to validate on that, because if we don't, we're not going to crash early enough. 
We're only going to crash when we try to use it to connect to something. And port numbers, integer is not that bad, but negative 12 is not a really good port number, and neither is 60 billion. Right? We could actually constrain both of these a lot more and crash early. So here's how we do it. We're going to make a new package that's going to be our type library. Now, type library is not a class. It's just a Perl package that has a bunch of type definitions that we can import and use. So we're going to call it network types. And we start off by saying, here are the types that I am going to declare. I'm going to declare in this file an IP address type and a port number type. And then we can get down to work. We don't, by the way, we don't need to say use strict or use warnings here. It's implied by uh, use moose types. And we don't really need to say no moosex types. We can, but since it's not a class, no one's going to be calling methods on this. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to bring in some of the base types. You remember earlier I said you could say int in quotes, or you could import int as a moosex type from moosex types moose. And that's what we're going to do, because we're going to define our new types in terms of our old types. So we just import them. And then here's our first type definition you're actually going to see. We're going to make our IP address type. We're going to say, I've got a subtype. It's called IP address. It's a kind of string. And it's a string where the following code is true. First, split it up by dots. You better get four things. If you didn't, give up. Then each quad has to be only digits. right? It must not match anything other than 0 through 9. And it has to be between 0 and 255 exclusive. Whether or not this is the best way to validate an IP address is not the issue. Right? The point is, this is fairly straightforward. What we've said is subtype says, here comes a subtype. Then it's name. Then if we want, we say as something else. What is it a subtype of? IP addresses are strings. And that means whenever we validate something that's meant to be an IP address, we make sure it's a string first. And then where says, here's some code to run. It puts the value into dollar underscore. And the code returns true or false. If it returns true, the value is of that type. If it returns false, the value is not. So this is like a critical slide. So take a moment. If you have any questions, you should totally ask them now. Then we'll move on. Next type is going to be a lot easier. Not only because it's the second one, because port numbers are pretty simple. We're going to make a port number, which is an integer between 0 and 2 to the 16th. This may vary by platform, but you get the point. Um, and as long as we're doing this, this is something I often find out. I start writing a type library because I've got two types in mind. And then I realize, well, as long as I've written this type, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. Like, how about a public IP address? Well, what is a public IP address? A public IP address is we declare it. And then we say a public IP address is just an IP address where it's not 127 address, and it's not a 10 address, and it's not you know all those. We, we strip out all the private networks. And the point here is you can subclass your own types. So once you've defined your broadest types, you can define all the subtypes you want. I've got a library at work that's full of types like non-negative integer, positive integer, positive blah, 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 right? All these, all these little types that are almost, you look at them and you think it's too trivial, right? Why do you have these little types? But when all of your code is full of things that just say, this has to be a non-negative integer. This has to be a line with no trailing white space. This has to be a string with, right? It's really, really clear when you read your code, which is great. We're always writing the code because we're going to read it later. Right? It's, not, it's not being written to, uh, to be written and get out of your fingers. It's written to get back into your eyes later. OK. So now we can go back to our socket class where we have these lousy types in use. And all we're going to do is say, I want to use network types and import the IP address and the port number. And having imported them, we can drop them right into our code like that, just like they were any other type, because they are. They are co-equal with every other type in your system. So this is great, right? We've got nice domain-specific validation. It didn't go into our socket class. It went into its own package called network types, which we can now upload to the CPAN and use everywhere in all of our code, enabling code reuse outside of just this class. And it's all sunshine and roses until some guy does this. And we said that a port has to be a number between 0 and 65,000. So on one hand, 
the fact that we would reject this is fine, right? We're going to say, no, you have to say 80. But why, why, why do you have to say 80, right? This is totally cromulent. HTTP is a well-known name. In fact, Perl has a way to translate this for us. So we could say we're going to make a new type, and we're going to call this new type service name. Something is a service name if it's a string, and we can get an answer for what is the service name port for TCP of this name. If you haven't, this is a Perl built-in. Perl has some built-ins that you very rarely see, and when you see them, you say, why wasn't this in a library? Um, it's kind of like, uh, like a little tiny slice of PHP. Um, get served by name, you give it a number and a network uh, family, and it tells you um, a, a network protocol, and it tells you the port number. So if you say HTTP, it returns 80. So now we could say a port can be either of these. Okay, the port can be a port number or a service name, and this works. But it kind of stinks. Because now every time you call self arrow port, you don't know what you got. Are you getting back a number or are you getting back a service name? And all your code everywhere through your whole program needs to start being polymorphic, right? I don't know what kind of parameter I'm going to get, so I better check for which one it could be. We're going to go one better than this. And instead of using um, a, a type union, and type un this is called a type union because we've got two type, type domains and we've unioned them together. Never use them, right? Just don't use them. I, I don't think I've ever used one, maybe unless it was a joke. Um, there are probably situations where it makes sense if you have four ways of validating different kinds of strings, and once you validated them, they're all treated equally. Okay, right, that's all right. But that's not what we have, and it's not what you usually will have. What we want to do is always know the type that comes out of port, and probably we want numbers. So how do we deal with this problem? We say, I know a way to coerce a port number from a service name. If you give me a service name, I can give you a port number. How do I do it? I do it, again, by calling get served by name. So if anyone says, I want a socket to talk to finger, this will correctly pick the right socket, the correct port. It's 71? I don't know. Um, and, uh, we go back to our definition, we drop the union, and we replace it with port number again, because we know how to coerce from one to the other. But this is not enough. If you do this and someone passes in HTTP, it's going to say, no good, I needed a number. You have to say, in this context, you should try coercing if you can. This is one of the top five mistakes made by, I was going to say by new, new Moose programmers, but everybody makes this. Forgetting coerce is really, really easy. Even if you have um, all your coercion set up, if you don't say this is where to coerce, it won't. Uh, one of the main reasons it does this is because of global types. If you set up all these different global types that can coerce one to the other, and then you turn on coercions, you don't know what coercions exist because you don't control the whole world. Moosex types make this a lot safer but it doesn't change the fact that you still got to say coerce one. Okay. It also gets you stuff like this. If you've imported that type, you get a routine called to port number. So this is, again, a kind of ubiquity of your type definitions. Not only can you use it for validating, you can use it for coercing. So you can write a subroutine that expects anything that can be treated as a port number. A really, really nice thing to do here is you can write a coercion from a hash ref to a kind of object. So anytime you need an object, someone can pass in the arguments to build it from the known class. Really, really nice stuff. So whenever you want to build your own types, you start off with use MooseX types declare, and you give it some names. And then you use subtype to make the new types. And the three parts are subtype, as, where. And when you want to add a coercion, it's coerce the new thing from the old thing via some callback. So building your own types really powerful. Um, I, I, for a long time, I didn't write my own types. I mean, for, maybe for years, I was not writing my own types in Moose because it was just a pain. It was weird. It didn't look normal, and you know, integers were good enough. Once I started writing a couple of my own types, which I could then like, have coercing to one another and reuse across different projects at work, the amount of code and bugs that went away was huge. So I cannot urge you enough um, to consider type constraints one of the pillars of, of Moose's uh, power. It's not just a bolt-on. Okay, any questions about, about building types before we keep going? 
Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is delegation. Delegation. Delegation is another kind of code reuse. Uh, it's another alternative to inheritance. Just like we had uh, composition of roles, delegation to, to sub-objects is another way to avoid writing specialized subclasses of code. It's really, really powerful. So instead of including methods from a role, we put the methods on a proxy object, or some delegate, and we pass them on to that. So here's some, some code you may remember from earlier, our logger. And the logger needs a transmitter. And the transmitter is there to get this send string method. So whenever we log something, first we check whether the log level is high enough. Do we actually care about this message enough to transmit it? And if we do, we get the transmitter and we send this message to the transmitter with its send string message method. And we know that it has a send string method because we've required that it does the transmitter role. So far, everything looks pretty good. But it's, it's a nice bit of refactoring and it makes things more flexible. But I think this is a little gross. Right? We're always getting this transmitter object, so we have to keep thinking about this delegation. We can eliminate the middle bit, and we could do this. So we're going to say this transmitter object handles the send string method. So if you call send string on the, this on the logger, it is proxied to the transmitter. And then down here, we can just say self send string. So we don't have to worry about the intermediate object. It, it becomes invisible. Uh, the problem here is, it's kind of weird for a logger to have a method called send string. Like, what does it mean for a logger to send a string? I guess, you know, you can make the argument, well, clearly it must send it to wherever the logs go. But we want to name our things so that anybody who skims the code knows what's going on. So a better name for this might be log unconditionally. There's no longer any reason to check the log level. We will call log unconditionally only after conditions have been met. And we can do that by rewriting our handles, instead of as an array ref, instead of a list of method names, we make it a mapping. Here are some things I handle. If someone calls log unconditionally on the logger, proxy that to the transmitter's send string method. So we can build our own API with names that make sense in the domain of our class that proxy off to something else that implements it with a generic set of names or names that, that are specific to what it means. A transmitter has a way to send a string. A logger has a way to log without concern for whether it should log. And then down here, log, first check the conditions, then log unconditionally. The code becomes a lot clearer. So, um, this made sense. This makes more sense. I, I'll take a moment here to say, Oh, this is not the slide I want. My slide is missing. I, I just love has. Like, almost everything we've done today has just been, like, you throw this one argument into has, and you get a ton more awesome behavior. Okay, so this guy. Um, network socket. So we want, our, we want our network socket to be a viable way to log stuff. And to do that, we had to give it the transmitter role. Because the logger wants a transmitter. It's got that xmitter attribute that holds a transmitter object, an object that does transmitter, and that way it knows that it has send string. But let's take it a step further. We're gonna write a new role called transmitter complex. And what is a transmitter complex? Well, transmitter complex is a role that includes another role. So this is an important side note. Roles can consume other roles. You can't subclass a role, but you can have role A with role B, which is how you compose these things. And that means we know that a transmitter complex is going to have a send string. It's got to happen. It's required for anything that will ever instantiate that, that it have send string. And now we can add some advice to send string. And we can add attributes that store, for example, how much we have sent and received. So our transmitter complex will log the length of everything we send and the length of everything we receive and store it. And because we know Because we know that transmitter complex includes transmitter, we can, there's a lot of space at the bottom of that slide. We can use a transmitter complex anywhere that we used to use a transmitter. Because it, it is a transmitter. It does the same role. So for example, we can go back to our network client and we can say, this thing has a socket and the socket can be anything that does transmitter complex. 
And if we want the client to have a send string and have send string delegate to the socket, now this makes sense. We're going to keep the same name. So the client's send string will go to the socket, and the send lines will go to the socket, and stream lines will go to the socket. We can delegate all of those methods at once. And we don't need to give an array ref of names, because what names do we want to delegate? We want to delegate all the methods that are implied by being a transmitter complex. So we can say, this handles the transmitter complex role. And by doing this, we can, <laughs> we can make it the case that our HTTP client is also a transmitter complex. So these roles, which are names for a hunk of behavior, can be used not just to promise that you provide the behavior, not just to give an implementation of the behavior, but also to set up delegations of sets of behavior from one object to another. Does that all make sense so far? And what, what's happening here is that writing this stuff here with does and handles is just reusing type constraints. So we could have written this. We could have said, these, this is taking a role type and reusing it between the two. And in fact, if we go back to that logger that I was talking about earlier, where we had to use a duck type, I had to say, well, I'm putting something in here that isn't necessarily moose, so I can't constrain based on the idea that it does a role. I have to go by methods. Just like when use it, we can use it to constrain the values for that attribute, we can use it for delegating. And we can say, all the methods that are required, those are also the methods that I proxy. Okay, and finally, um, maybe just for sure comedy value, here's the silliest kind of delegation you can perform. You can delegate by regex. Uh, this is rarely a good idea. Uh, but it, it's again, you know, Moose is building on the idea of what Perl is. And Perl is a tool that you can use to shoot yourself in the foot. So we want to continue to provide this, this kind of power. So we've got a logger. The logger is, is some object that's read-only. You need to have it. Now, how are we going to delegate stuff to this? Because we know we want to delegate all, all kinds of methods, but object doesn't imply any set of methods. Um, and we don't really know what the methods might be. Let's just handle everything. So any method that object has, we're going to delegate to it. This can be useful for doing stuff like writing a debugging layer. You know, you pass it some delegate, and it just wraps itself around everything. Really, really interesting stuff. Don't use it. Know that it's there. If you see it, you will know why the code works, and you will know which line to delete. Um, so delegation, um, delegation gives you a way to get a local method, right? a method in your class that delegates to a method on a proxy object. It can have the same name, or it can have a different name. I encourage you to pick different names. Um, when you use a different name, you can pick a name that relates to your domain, which keeps all of your classes making the most sense. Um, in small talk, you see this a lot. You know, you have a method that's got some name, and all it does is call one other method. But it means that whenever you're reading your code, you know exactly what everything does. You can delegate by roles. You can delegate by a list of methods or by duck types. And uh, yeah, that regular expression thing, that, that happens. Um, and a warning. This is an important warning. I love, first of all, let me say I love delegation. And I probably use delegation to implement almost as many kinds of code reuse as I do for roles. Um, I use delegation all the time because it means I can have these little objects that get passed around. Whereas with roles, I'm only getting methods and behavior that I can't instantiate, I can't reuse. Uh, testing them alone can be a pain. Delegates aren't like that. They're standalone black box objects. The problem is that it's really, really useful. But if you do it too freely, you're digging a pit for yourself. Because every time you are adding methods that you delegate to some proxy, you're adding methods, right? And that means your API is getting bigger. And every time your object adds more methods, it means that refactoring your object or changing its implementation or replacing it with a totally new implementation is harder because you have to provide the whole API you've been promising. And that is one of the reasons to consider delegating privately, internally. Like, I have these methods. You can, you can use the mapping form. So instead of saying log unconditionally becomes send string, maybe underscore log unconditionally. So yes, you've delegated. Your code is easy to read internally, but you're not adding these methods to your public interface that people think are all part of what you promise forever and ever and ever. Uh, adding, adding stuff to your API is always something you have to do uh, carefully and decide whether or not you really want to make things harder in the future. Okay, Questions on delegation? Okay. Next thing to talk about is traits. And you're thinking, we already talked about traits. 
traits are what everybody else calls roles, right? Well, that's right. But the reason that we don't call them traits is that so we can use the word traits to mean something else. Yay! Um, don't blame us. We got it from Larry. Um, traits, traits in Perl 6 are like attributes in Perl 5. Does that help? Of course it doesn't help. Um, traits, traits are a way of changing individual little data or subroutines. And in Perl 6, they mean a totally different idea than what they mean in Moose, but the intent is the same. It's of taking one specific thing and tweaking it rather than having a whole class of things that have been tweaked. More specifically, in Moose, a trait is a role, but it's not a role we build into a class. It's a role that we apply to an instance, to one object. So for example, we've got our noisy network socket, right? We've seen this before. This is some, some old code we've seen. But we wouldn't really write this, right? What we would probably write is, rather than using extends, subclassing, which, which I don't use, we would write a role. So we've got this noisy role, and it does exactly the same thing. It applies some method modifiers to these methods. And then, when we want a noisy network socket, we have a package that extends network socket with no code of its own and just brings in that role. But this is dumb. Right? First of all, we're back to using extends, which I just said I don't use. Secondly, one of the cool things about roles is you know you can safely compose an arbitrary number of them and it will always either work or fail to compile. But now, for any arbitrary composition of roles, we need to make a new file that's a class that has no code and just a list of roles. It's lame. Why do we don't want to do that? Because we want roles to save us time, not to make us spend a time on stupid work. So now, we can make a socket, and we're going to do this. First, make a socket, and now apply roles directly to the object. So we haven't had to make a class. We haven't had to write package, network, socket, noisy, lazy, and surly. Uh, we just say, I get an object, and then I throw on a bunch of roles to it. And only that instance gets those roles. Every other network socket is unaffected. But there's a problem. This is, doesn't actually work. If anybody can tell why this isn't going to work, I, would, I will give you a free bottle of water. No. Yeah, it's not, it's not a great price. Um, the reason is... When we defined noisy network sockets, we said they had to have a transmitter. Right? You can't have a noisy network socket without somewhere to send the noise. But when we've built this, network socket doesn't need a transmitter. So it doesn't have one. And then we apply the noisy role, and it's, it's going to be entering a bad state where the object needs to have an attribute that it doesn't have. And, and then your whole life falls apart. So some versions of Moose, older versions, will let you do this. And then when you try calling the transmitter, you just get undef, even though there's a type constraint on it. So yeah, there's nothing in there. How does that happen? Well, it happened because you applied things directly to an instance. Newer versions will mostly detect this problem. And when you apply the roles, that will fail. But not always. It can only detect it in some cases, depending on how complicated your code is. But, your code is. but there is a solution. And the solution is, we go back to our network socket and we say, you know what, I've written a lot of roles for adding behavior to network sockets, and I know I'm probably going to use them mostly as one-offs. I'm not going to be building all these different permutation classes. So I'm going to bring in moosex traits. And traits says, I expect to need roles on a per-instance basis. And then when you want to make a network socket and you want that network socket to be noisy, you do this. I want network socket with these traits, make a new one. Now, what's actually happening behind the scenes is that Moose is doing all that crap that we said we didn't want to do. It's making a package, and it's saying it extends this, and here are all the roles that it's going to include. So all that stuff needs to happen. Um, it has to happen because of how Perl works, but you don't have to do it. And of course, that list you know, can come from anywhere, and you can have this all throughout your code doing all the different roles that you want, putting together these classes at runtime on the fly and getting all the validation you need. So traits are just a way of applying a role to a single object. It is something that 
is not done anywhere near as frequently as it should be done, I think, uh, because it lets you very easily go into your code, find a single thing. You can imagine having a, a conditional around this and saying, you know, if I'm connecting to Amazon, then I want you to apply the noisy role because I'm having trouble talking to them lately. But everything else gets a normal socket. It's a, it's a way of jumping into your code and very specifically tweaking with little parts of it. That's all they are. There are roles that are applied to instances. You can do it in a couple different ways. Okay, questions about traits or anything else? I'm going to take a little break here and drink some water and listen to questions, so you better have some. Ah, that's disappointing. I still came out of water. Um, so, Moose. So we've been using Moose for all this stuff, right? And I haven't really answered the question of, of what Moose is which is kind of a dodge, right? Because I said that's what I was going to promise to do. I've only told you what Moose does, which, to be fair, it's pretty important, right? You, the, the, you're here to learn why to use Moose and how to use Moose and, and why it's awesome. But I want to talk about what it is um, because I don't want it to be a mystery. I don't want it to seem like, wow, that is really cool stuff, but it's still totally magic and this guy lied to me. Um, unfortunately, to explain what it is, I have to go a step deeper and start talking about this thing called class mop. And rather than talk about class mop, really, I want to talk about this. Um, this is a book. This is actually the cover of a computer science book called The Art of the Meta Object Protocol. And um, it's possibly my favorite cover of any computer book. To give you the idea of what the book is about, um, it says, imagine you've got an object system. And the object system has things like classes and instances and attributes, and they all interact in well-known ways, right? Classes have attributes. Each instance points to one class and has one slot per attribute with a value, right? And you can imagine this whole modeling thing. And if you can imagine that whole model, you could model that whole model with objects. So you could build, an ob you could build a set of objects that model your objects. Sorry, I <laughs> lost my uh, timer here. Um, for example, right, a class has a bunch of methods and a bunch of attributes and some roles. And attributes also might be in roles, and so might methods and instances. Right? It's, it's a whole tree. And it's easy to imagine if you diagram what object-oriented programming looks like to diagram how it's all going to work. You know, how is this thing working? It's kind of a mess, but you can easily figure out what it would look like, and you could build your own. Um, now, to, for full disclosure, I did not study computer science. Um, I, I really wanted to. I heard it was a really glamorous career, and, uh, and the people who were in that program were just constantly being offered amazing jobs and great money and free drugs. Um, I, I studied the more glamorous field of philosophy. So this is only my imagination of what you might be learning in computer science school. Uh, please don't tell me that it's, that it's not like this. I need to keep my dreams. Um, here, so here's your homework assignment for CS. You would have to go home and build a whole new object orientation system for your language of programming. It has to follow the usual rules that everybody kind of understands. And you have to build it with Moose. So we're going to build a representation of OO programming with our OO programming system. So what's it going to look like? Something like this. We've got a class. It's a Moose class. And every class has a name. And what's the name? Eh, it's a, some kind of package name. right? And you've got to have one. What else does a class have? Uh, it's got methods. And a method is a thing that maps from an identifier to a code ref. And if you don't give it any when you build it, then it doesn't have any. It's got an empty mapping. It's got some attributes. right? Our classes have attributes. And those map from identifiers to attribute rolled things something that are like attributes. We'll come back to what those might be later, I think. And this looks a pretty, a pretty decent start. Um, a class is a thing that has a name and some methods and some attributes. So we're kind of on the road to implementing our OO system. We need a way to make an instance, right? Some way to make an object of this class. So we write a method. And note this method is not, it's not in our instance method mapping. This is a thing that a class can do. A class can make a new object. And the object says, OK, I'm going to make a new instance. The instance has a class. The class is me. 
and it's going to have some slots. So we go onto this object that we, we built, and we initialize all of its slots. Which slots? The slots from our attributes. And I'm going to kind of fly through this. Don't try to understand the whole thing. The point is that you can do this. Our classes might have super classes. So now we've just implemented inheritance. And you can make a new subclass. How do you make a new subclass? Given a class, you just make a class that points back to this one from its superclasses array. And in our instances, uh, we see we need an instance class, and it needs some way to initialize slots. So let's go write that. We've got a, an instance package. It has a class. Its class is a class. And it's got a way to initialize slots where it gets some stuff and it asserts that it's valid from the attributes type and it puts it into self's guts and that implies that we need guts. What's guts? I don't know, it's like a hash ref or something. And that's where we store the object's slots. And to build guts, what do we do? Well, you know, we make some storage. The storage is a hash ref and we stick that into an attribute. And we might make a strict kind of instance. Now here is where things get interesting. What we've done is we make a thing called instance strict. And once it has been made, we use build to lock the keys. If you haven't seen lock keys, it's basically a way of telling Perl, don't let anybody change the keys in this hash. So what does that mean? It means that from now, if you take that instance and you try to add or remove any data from its guts, where we stored its attribute slots, you're going to get an exception. The interesting thing is not that we've been able to add an exception for this. It's that having implemented object-oriented programming with object-oriented programming, we can now apply object-oriented programming to our object-oriented programming implementation of object-oriented programming. And what that means is you can subclass the very idea of what a class is and how it behaves. You can subclass how attributes work. You can apply roles to instances. Right? This here is a subclass uh, a subclass of instance. We could have written this as a role that we apply to instances. So by modeling OO with OO, we let us use all of the tools we already have for changing the tools that we're using. As you can imagine, it takes a while for that concept to seep all the way down. The book that I showed you, it's pretty good. Um, it's, a little it's a little technical at times. Um, but getting this idea it's okay if you write Moose and you never use the meta layer. Most of the code I write in Moose does not use the, the meta layer. It doesn't go back and, and screw with how objects and classes work. But every once in a while, you can realize that you could do that. And you could change your problem. You could make your problem go away by redesigning how attributes work in this one object you're working on. And that's what meta object protocol is about. It's about these ways that objects interact and how you can screw around with them. So um, class colon colon mop is a meta object protocol for Perl 5 and it implements classes and instances, attributes and methods and method modifiers. And it puts all of those into these things. Right? So this is just a model for how OO works in Perl. If you want, instead of writing packages and putting subroutines in them, you could do it all by making a new class object and saying, I'm going to make a class object and add an attribute object to it. You would never want to do this. It's incredibly verbose and awful. But this gives you a model to think about it. But this is only telling us what class mop is. So what's moose? Well, moose is a subclass of class mop. So a moose class is like a normal class. And a moose instance is like a normal instance, but with extra behavior. Right? And, and added, uh, added functionality between them. And then you get roles. Well, a role is a kind of object, but it's, it's got all kinds of strange new behavior that you don't find in class mop. Well, why don't you find it there? Because Perl doesn't have it. Right? It doesn't really exist. What, what time am I ending, by the way? I don't even know. I started at 9, 12.30? 12.30. Um, great. Um, and type constraint. Like a type constraint is an object, but a type constraint has no analog in the standard Perl the standard Perl system. So we've just implemented this new kind of thing. And you can do that too if you're writing code in the meta layer. You can implement whole new kinds of concepts that your, your object orientation needs. You don't need to do that. But keep it in mind as you work with more and more Moose how you can subvert the paradigm of the problem and fix it that way. So let's say we see this code in Perl. Package network socket, use Moose, with transmitter, has port. 
right? Hopefully that code is all pretty transparent to everybody. We've, it's the basics of things we've done. Here is what really happens under the hood. And this is actually very, very, very close to the code that is actually run when you write these lines. First, it makes a meta class object. A meta class object is a thing that models your class. Its name is network socket. And then it finds a role called transmitter, which basically means it looks around in memory or on disk. Then it tells the role to apply itself to the class. And then I seem to be missing the next slide, which should be there, uh, which would say, and then it builds an attribute. And it says something like meta class arrow add attribute port blah, blah, blah. So all that's happening is it's building up this model in memory of what you've asked it to do, and then it compiles it into Perl code, and that is what Moose gives you. So the MOP is an OO system for building an OO system, and because it's all written with concepts you understand and can mutate, you can mutate the very behavior of your OO, and Moose is just that. Moose is just a MOP for Perl 5 with a ton of extra added features, and um, you can use that power not just to get Moose itself, but to extend Moose and change how Moose works to fit your needs. So the question some of you may be asking is, why? Why are you telling us this? Um, I really, really was going to skip this the, the first time I wrote this talk. And I realized that having started by saying that none of this stuff is magic, I wanted to make sure how clear it was that this wasn't magic. And how, you know, you can see all this stuff and jump in and say... Um, no, yeah, well, sure, I can use a type constraint, but what the hell happens? Well, it's just, it's just this. It's building stuff. You can just go look at Moose model, Moose meta type constraint, and see exactly what a type constraint is. And once you do that, it's going to look like this stuff at the bottom here, which is just Perl. There's nothing to it. I mean, the model's a little complicated, but that's it. Um, so I'm going I'm to stop talking about that now. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to go back to things that are actually useful in your day-to-day -day programming. Before I do that, do, do we have any questions about the mop? Yes? Yeah, so um, the, the comment is that if you, if you install class mop, it does install some C. Uh, so it's not all pure Perl. And the C that it installs, it's not interesting, and you shouldn't worry about it. What happens is sometimes the MOP needs to look at, for example, a, a subroutine in memory and find out what its name is. So if you have, like, $x equals sub blah, 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 it doesn't have a name. But if you say $x equals backslash ampersand in the name of a named subroutine, there's a way to get the name of the subroutine, uh, but you need to use XS code to get it. And there's some other things like that. Um, so there are some data you can't inspect in Perl. Perl. Perl has a limited amount of introspection, and some of it you can only get through C, and that's why it's there. But when you read the class mop code, it's obvious what's going on, even if you don't read the C stuff. Does that answer your concern? Well, um, I was wondering whether you get some speed advantage. Uh, is there speed? Right, so um, there, there are a number of questions, and I think I may get back to this a little later, but uh, it often comes up like, dude, I heard Moose is really slow. Um, and Moose, is, Moose isn't the fastest. Well, okay, no. At runtime, Moose is probably faster than what you would write by hand because it's all generating code that is highly optimized, that has had lots of things inlined into it, that occasionally is using C where it can. Um, and so you get a speed boost from a very limited number of things like that from the excess. At compile time, well, what did I show you? I showed that when you said with and you say has, in the background, it's building these you know, object trees that define what your class hierarchies look like. Well, that's got a little cost to it. It's not a lot of cost, but you tend to see uh, a, a, a compile time overhead when you're using Moose. You know, it depends on your machine, but I see something like 0 0.1, 0 0.15 seconds for a program that uses Moose in startup time. Um, obviously, that varies a lot. If you're writing daemons or you're writing things that talk to a database or over the network, you're never going to notice this. If you're writing something that otherwise is blazing fast doing a tiny bit of file I.O., yeah, you might see it. And I, I may be able to come back and talk about some ways to make it faster. Any other questions? Okay. So on next, I'm going to talk about native traits. So we talked about traits. What are native traits? So with that CPAN distribution code, right, where we were, we were looking at making prereqs, and... 
this is fine. We've constrained the prerequisites to be a list of package names, an array ref of package names. And it prevents us from doing this, which is nice. If you try to initialize it, the type constraint says, no, all the values need to be package names. So it won't let you do it. You put in, there's a missing colon, if you didn't notice. You put the colon in, everything works. But here's a question for you. What is the return value of that method? Anybody? Take a guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a reference. It's a reference to that, to that array ref. So you're getting a reference to something in the object's guts. You may have heard me a little earlier saying how dangerous it is to think about having references into the object's guts. Because it means that some knucklehead, possibly you, can later do this. At construction time, you have been prevented from putting bad data in there because the type does a type check. But then you have the reference. There's no magic. There's nothing that is like intercepting, touching this array reference. It can't do that. It's all about the methods you get. So if you want to put some garbage into that array, you can totally subvert the type system. And then you will cry, and it will be bad. So the way you fix that is by never, ever, ever doing this. But sometimes you need to change what's in there. The only thing we have to access it is this read only. Oh, by the way, notice that it's read only. It's read only, but yeah, you, what you read is a reference. <laughs> so it's, it's still pretty mutable. So the only re method that we have to deal with this is prereqs. That's the only method for that attribute. So all we can do is replace it with a new reference, right? That's no good. We need other behavior associated with this class that will safely update the data. So the first thing we do is we say, I want to apply traits to this attribute. Now, you know what traits are, right? Traits are roles that we apply to one instance. What's the instance here? It's the instance of attribute. This is, this is the mop at play, right? We've got an attribute object that models this. And what does an attribute object do? It has stuff like validate value and store value. And we're adding a trait to that attribute object to change, uh, to change one of its behaviors. So we're adding a role and tweaking all or some of the behaviors of that attribute. Specifically, what behaviors are we tweaking? We're tweaking how it handles handles, delegation. The traits, the array trait, lets us delegate methods to the array. Now, arrays don't have methods, but we can pretend they do, and that's just what we're going to do. We're going to act like the array has a method called push, and we're going to delegate that via add prereq. So if someone calls dollar self arrow add prereq like that, well, sorry, not like this. So you can do these. And the first one is fine. It's safe. The second one is terrible because you're screwing with the guts. And the third one is just as bad, right? We're getting the reference out, dereferencing it, and pushing onto it. We tell people, don't ever, ever do that. Instead, do this. The first two will, will live. This third one is now going to fail. You're going to get a type error. It's going to say, I can't put some junk into the prereqs. Because prereqs is an array ref of package names, and some junk is not a valid package name. So we had is read only. All that is read only does is gives, give us a reader. And what does the reader do? It gives us a reference. We never want to have a reference, so we get rid of that reader. We don't want it. Just kick it out. Now the only thing we can do is use this. So if you tried writing it this way, the first two will also fail. They're not going to fail because of a type error. They're going to fail because there's no re method called prereqs. You can't do it. And if we fix that third one to actually be a valid package, the first two will still fail. We don't need to worry about the type anymore because we've killed off any way to get that reference. And the third one will work because now we're, we're using the correct way to talk to that, that attribute, and the type is correct. Uh, what I don't show here, and I, I probably should, is once we've gotten rid of the reader, uh, how do you find out what the prerequisites are? 
because that was kind of important. Well, there's another delegation we can use. So there's push. There's all kinds of stuff we can delegate. And one of them is called elements. So we could add handles prereqs. And now we've got that prereqs method back. And we'll delegate it to elements. And it will now return a list. So instead of getting a, uh, an array reference to that same array, we now get a list totally safe. You can change that list all you want after you put it in an array. It's not going to touch the guts at all. Of course, array is not the only kind of traits. There's also hash. In our original version of this code, we did not have an array of package names. We had a map from package names to lax version strings. And here we can apply a hash trait. And hash lets us delegate the kind of things you might expect a hash to have, like set. And set takes a key and a value, and it sets it respecting type safety. That all make sense? So arrays give you uh, stuff you'd expect, right? Push, pop, shift, unshift, blah, blah, blah. You can imagine the list. If you can't imagine the list, you can go look it up in the documentation. But it's, it's basically all the built-ins you'd want on an array. Hash, the same thing. I can tell you, you know, what's in there, put stuff in there, clear the whole thing. Other, there are other kinds of native traits that you might not expect that are great. String. This is a string. Give me a way to append and prepend and substring and slice it. Booleans. So you get toggles, a way to turn the Boolean on or off. Code. This is maybe my favorite. Um, this is an example that I probably should cut because it's a little too clever. But I'm going to do it anyway. Um, you can delegate to, the, to executing and executing code as a method. Here's an example. So we've got our network service, and it has a transmitter. And the transmitter does the transmitter role, and it's got a builder and a clearer. And we want to build it lazily. So we're going to get rid of build transmitter, because we don't want to have our own build transmitter. Once we put into our network service a way to build the transmitter, it's only going to return one kind of transmitter. We want it to have variable behavior, configurable behavior. So whenever you build a network service, you can tell us how to build its transmitter. Now, this is no easy problem. Or this, sorry, this is, this is no problem. Um, the problem is, we know that a lot of transmitter types are really expensive to build. So the issue was not to let the user pass in a transmitter. The issue is to let the user pass in a transmitter building method. Okay, The user is going to give us code that we will treat like a method. So how's that going to look? We're going to go here, and we're going to say, not only do we have a transmitter, we have a transmitter builder. The type is code ref. So whatever we put in that attribute, needs to be a code reference. It has the code trait, so we can delegate to it. And we delegate any call to build xmitter to executing that subroutine as if it was a reference. So what does that mean? It means that when the transmitter tries to call its builder, which is called underscore build transmitter, it delegates it to this code routine. It calls that code, and it passes it self as the first argument, as if it was really a method. Should I explain that again? It's going to let you pass in a code root, a piece of code, and have that act exactly as if it was a method. So you can build objects that have a whole bunch of behavior hard-coded in their classes, but have on a per-instance basis methods provided by the user. And then you can just do something like this. I want a network service. When or if you need its transmitter, here is how to build it. If it doesn't come up, don't build it. So that is just one of the many applications of native traits. The traits argument for has lets us apply traits to that attribute object. Native traits are just one kind. The native traits are about native types. That's why they're called native. They are traits to make your attributes handle methods on native types, strings, numbers, booleans, code. There's a bunch of them, and you can use those for a lot of reasons, one of which is uh, power, like the code reference. One of them is uh, 
naming, so you can give domain-specific names to your methods that act on collections. And the other reason is type safety, which is a big reason. Uh, you really want to keep your type safety working. If one of the big benefits of Moose is type safety and constraining the possible states of your object, you have to use native traits if you ever have any data in your object other than simple scalars. Otherwise, your data are just exposed. OK, questions on the native traits. All right, Moose X. Um, a couple times we've seen stuff in the namespace Moose X. And there are hundreds of modules on the CPAN under the namespace Moose X something something. And uh, what does that mean? What is Moose X? And the answer is nobody really knows exactly what is meant by Moose X. Um, it's like in Perl 5, we say, having a module that's named all in lowercase is reserved for things that are pragmata. And what does it mean to be a pragma in Perl? I don't know. It's, it's, sorry? Yeah, you know it when you see it. If, if then, the, the way to identify a pragma is that it's got an all lowercase name. Um, it's, it's, it, it is unknown. Um, in theory, the idea is supposed to be something like, you use Moose X when you are writing an extension to the meta layer of Moose, or something else that you couldn't really implement unless you were touching the Moose internals, or other stuff. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I don't care what it really means. What I want to do here is just run through some other really cool stuff in Moose. In fact, let me take a moment and say, from this point out, we are entering sort of a miscellany, uh, a, a potpourri of cool Moose stuff. So if there are topical questions on things we've talked about, you probably want to ask them now. I mean, I'm happy to take questions through the whole day, but... Okay, great. So one of my favorite things is something called parameterized roles. So imagine you have code like this. You've got a logger, and it requires emit, right? Um, <clears throat> bear, bear with me. This is a lot like saying that you've written this. So you need to provide an emit callback, and the callback gets used as a method, just like we saw with build transmitter. It's very, very close to the same thing. Here we say, you have to give me this method named in your package. And here we're saying, when you build this thing, you have to give me this code. We, um, we delegate emit to its method via native traits, so we let you supply one. It looks for the, it looks for the emit message in log, and that's going to call the emit, the, um, the execute message method. So let's look at a complicated, let's look at a simpler example, because this one's complicated. We've got a, a, a pipe streamer, something that streams things to a pipe. This is nice and simple, but pipe name here, it's only expecting a constant. Okay? The only thing that that method needs to return is a constant. It's not providing code. When we had requires emit, the thing that emit had to show us was a whole block of code to run. Here it's just a string we're going to use. Like we might implement it like this. And imagine you had a bunch of these. Like you've got a network client. And auto socket will automatically give us a socket based on parameters. And we've got to provide all these parameters. And how are we providing them? With named methods. It's kind of gross. So first of all, it's ugly. We've got all these like constants in methods. And secondly, these are public methods. So we've added to our API. And we're not putting the stuff in our API because it's useful to end users. We put it in because AutoSocket needs it. We've got some, some role called AutoSocket that's going to say, require socket port, require socket destination, require socket source. And then it's going to have a thing, so, you know, sub socket, and it builds the socket based on this. What we want is a way for our class to pass those data to the role without having to do it by defining methods that the role looks for with requires. So we want to write this. So here is a role. I want you to use that role. I know this role requires parameterization. Here are the parameters. Really powerful. And then you can say stuff like, hey, does this, does this class implement AutoSocket? Yes, it does. And you know, you're not going to rename the methods. It's still going to implement this role. But its behavior can be customized to how you need it here. And what that means, it means that your roles are more reusable. 
because they are more generic. And every time you use them, you customize them just, just the amount that's needed. So the way you write auto socket would be like this. Instead of saying use moose roll, you'd say use moose x roll parameterized. You'd list your parameters. You got a source and destination, which are both required IP addresses, a socket type that you need, like you know, INET. And then in this block, you'd say here is the actual role. The role as constructed for this class, because remember how roles get composed into that composite role every time you apply them? That means that every role becomes a new object. So here we're building a new role object for each class. It gets the parameters that we had to give it. And it says this one's going to have a method that looks like this. And it can close over parameters. So this method is actually a closure over the parameters given when we included that role. You don't need to understand the intricacies of it. You need to understand that you can do this. So not only can you factor out your code, instead of into these like vertical, uh, brittle, hard to compose classes, you can break them out into reusable, horizontally composable, safe to put anywhere roles, and you can break all these constants out of your roles. And by the way, it doesn't work just with constants. When I said that saying you have to provide an emit method was a lot like saying you have to provide a callback, you could do the same thing. We could be passing here. We could just pass in one of these could be a callback that becomes a method that you get. You know you're going to get a method with the right name because the role will always install it under the correct name. But the behavior can be specific to that class or instance. I'm kind of speed up a little bit to get more stuff in these last 15 minutes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, validation. So, anybody here use params validate? Yeah, somebody? Okay. Params validate used to be like the premier data validation library in Perl. Um, I have never been a heavy user of it, but a lot of people are, and there's a lot of code out there that uses it like crazy. And with MooseX params validate, you can start using moose types to check stuff in your params validate. So if any of you were heavy users, you could realize that you could keep using it and use the things that you wrote as your moose types also in there. And if you're using other validation frameworks, uh, Brick, whatever else, you can take your moose types and you can use them in your, in your validation frameworks because the moose types themselves are objects of the well-defined API. MooseX method signatures. I don't use this. This is where I start to feel like it's scary magic. Um, but you can totally write this and say, my class has a method called greet. Here are its parameters. They get type checked. They get put into named variables. It's pretty nice. You can also bump up and use MooseX declare. And now your code starts to look a lot more like Perl 6. I'm declaring a class block. Here's the class. It's got a base class and a role. This stuff all just does, it does exactly what it looks like it should be doing. Um, here's a nice one. Um, where are you going with this? We've got a rectangle, and the rectangle only has a height and a width. You can imagine this rectangle. And much later in your code somewhere, you do this and you give it a color. Because you're pretty sure that rectangles have a color. You haven't looked at the source code in a while. And you hit my least favorite design decision in Moose, which is that this is accepted with no problem. If you give extra bogus information to the constructor, nothing bad happens. And in case you are wondering, yes, you are going to end up giving bogus extra information to your object constructors. So there is a thing, Moose X strict constructor. And that's going to make your constructors strict. Uh, of all the little add-ons that I, that I talk about, this is the one I really think everybody should be using. You can still use uh, extra parameters that will get picked up by build or build args, for example. That will still work. But if you just accidentally throw in stuff that you didn't mean to put in, like, for example, you typo an attribute name of a non-required attribute. This will tell you. 
If you don't use strict constructors, you won't find out until much later at runtime when you realize that you've used the default instead of the value you thought you passed in. So naming conventions. Normally, things work like this. You ask for a read-only attribute, you get a reader. And if it was not read-only and was read-write, that thing at the bottom would act like a writer. Right? Moose calls these accessors, things that are read if they have no arguments and write if you give them an argument. That's pretty standard. It's, it's the standard way of making this stuff work in Perl. Some people prefer to use set and get, like Perl Best Practices says you should provide these two things separately. And if you like that, you can just say, I want to use moosex follow pbp. And when you say I have a read only attribute, it will give you a get for that. And when you try calling set, it's, there's no method. It's just not going to exist. But if you'd made it read write, it would exist and it would do the thing you wanted. And of course, the way that works is by interfacing with your class's mop layer. Nope. No. So what happens is when you use, the, the question was, will the other methods still exist? Um, what happens is when you've used moosex follow pbp, it finds the default attribute meta class for your class, and it tweaks the way that it determines names for methods. Uh, and, and then everything happens normally, except when it gets to that point, well, what names should I use? And it finds a different answer than usual. So it doesn't do both, it only does the new behavior. Uh, if you if you have different feelings, there's also uh, Musex semi affordance accessor, which is just another set of naming conventions where the, the reader is the name and the setter has set. Great. So all this kind of stuff is the kind of stuff you can do with a little bit of elbow grease and, and messing around with the metal layer. <laughs> there's Musex singleton, which lets you have singletons. Uh, don't have singletons, please. Um, but there's a way to do it. And you can have attributes. These become attributes on your, on your singleton object or on the class itself. Like class attribute lets you have attributes not only on instances of a class, but on the class itself. It's, both this and singletons are things uh, that are good in really, really limited circumstances. But if you like class attributes, that is the same thing as liking singletons. Right, because it's like you've got a singleton object that represents the class's data. And if you like singletons, then you like global variables. And you don't like global variables. Right? Right. Um, there's a bunch of roles that are out there. One of them is throwable. Throwable is really, really simple. It just gives you a method called throw. And when you call it, it's like saying die my object. And you can use this for making simple exception classes. For example, using th uh, throwable error, which is a, a slight refinement on that. So you could say, I've got a kind of error called a permission error. It's an error, and it's got to have a who, right? Like, who tried to do this thing that caused the error? And then anywhere in your code, you can say, throw a permission error. Here's the message, and here's who tried doing it. And if you wanted, you could use something like uh, build args to make it easy to throw like that. This is, in fact, how I do all of my exceptions in all of my code. It's all Moose classes. They become really, really, really easy to use. Does anyone here use exception class? Yeah, some heads nodding. Uh, exception class was great when it was new. Um, the author basically says, no, please use throwable now. Exception class has to reinvent all this stuff about building classes to describe your error hierarchy that was a pain in the butt in normal Perl, but with Moose is so easy that you just use Moose for it and then say, yeah, and you can throw this thing and you get a stack trace for free. OK. Um, MooseX getopt. This is a way of writing scripts that are getops. You can see that verbose comes from dash v in your command line. So you can use this for writing all of your command line programs. I don't use it. A lot of people really like doing this. LWP, let's skip that one. OK. Isn't Moose slow? Well, we talked about this a little bit. Um, <clears throat> right. <laughs> the other thing to think about when people talk about the speed of Moose is that for the most part, you only pay for the features that you use. So people say, you know, I'm not really sold on Moose. I took my library and I rewrote it to use Moose. And then I had to type constraints. 
and had some co some coercions because people said that was important. I had all a bunch of delegates and some attributes and these native traits, and now everything is slow. Right, because you added a ton more code. Um, the more you use, the more moose costs. Um, I use all those features all the time. Um, I tend to find that people will complain about things being slow because they heard that it's supposed to be slow and they can see some potentially immeasurable dis di difference. There is a cost, right? If you start putting type constraints all over the place, you have an object that now has 10 type constraints and you make 1,000 of them per second, right, That's, you are now running a ton more code. Moose heavily optimizes it, it inlines it, but it's gonna, it's gonna be more expensive. And the two things I will say are, first, decide whether you need all that extra code, right? You might, you might, but you might not. If you control every entry point to your code, do you need type validation at every stage of it? Probably not. The second thing is, if you think your code is slow, the correct response is to profile your code and to see what the slow stuff is. Because even though Moose can be slow, it's almost entirely slow at compile time. Its runtime is fairly quick, and I will guess that almost every time you will find the slowness is somewhere else. But Moose can be slow. I don't want to be a total Moose apologist. Moose can be slow in some cases, but always find out what's really slow. Don't just pick something. Um, some people, though, who, who are more concerned about speed than I, I'm also really not concerned about speed. I, I, I'm laid back. If my code is slow, that's cool. Some people are not. They like really, really need it to be fast all the time, and they will use Moo. Moo is a lot like Moose, but less so. Um, in theory, it stands for Minimalist Object Orientation. Uh, there's also something called Mouse, which was Moose without the antlers. Um, the way I explain this is that Moose has this amazing mop, right? This huge amount of code that makes everything go and crazy powerful. And then there's the sugar, right? Stuff like has. All has is is a really short function that does something like build an attribute object and stick it onto a meta class. It's, it's very, very short, despite all the things has can do. So that's like another little bit. And then the last bit of Moose is just all the hype, like about how amazing it is. That's the least functional part. Um, and these are what people sometimes call the antlers, right, the mop. That's where all the work is, all the slowness and all the features. And Moo and Mouse are like that. They give you some features and some power, but there's basically no meta object protocol, which means you can't do crazy stuff and extend it. And often that's fine, right? Think way back to the beginning. And what's one of the first things I showed you? It was look how easy it is to write a class in Lisp and Smalltalk and Ruby and PHP and everything else, and look how crappy it is in Perl. If all you want to do is model a bunch of little things that have some attributes and that's all, Moo is fine, you don't need a meta object protocol. But as soon as you want triggers and type constraints interacting with uh, your plugins and parameterized roles and all the features you saw growing and growing and growing, there comes a point where Moose just does more and does it better than Moo and Mouse. Whether you want to start with Moo and upgrade later or start with Moose and switch to Moo when you need speed is up to you. I always start with Moose, but this is the difference and that is the other thing to keep in mind. The difference is not speed alone, it is speed because of the number of things you get. Yeah, Mouse and Moo basically can do this and that's about it. It's roughly the limit of how well they work. Now Moo, the interesting thing about Moo is that if you start using Moo and have then load Moose and try to treat a Moo class as if it was a Moose class, it will like transform itself magically into one. Kind of freaks me out, but it works. Um, okay, so. I think we're just about done. Um, that is in fact, yeah, that's, that's the end. Great, that is, that is the first time I've ever made it through all of those slides. Uh, I hope I didn't skip a section. Questions? Is Moose available on Active State Pro? I don't know, but it's got to be. Um, I have not. I used to use Active State a lot. I don't use Active State anymore because I don't use Windows anymore. But Moose is a dependency of a 
a million things in the CPAN now. It would be mind-blowing to me if Active State did not have a working Moose build. I can tell you that Moose works on Windows. Um, I, I have a number of large libraries that use Moose and that I test regularly on Windows. So it does work, and it does build right out of the box. So there's no reason for Active State not to have it. And do you have another question? Is there a minimum version of Perl required for Moose? I believe that it is 581. There's a lot of discussion some now and again between the various Perl, uh, Moose core developers about what the minimum required version should be. Some people really want to bump it up to 510, 512. But there's not a lot of justification other than trying to tell people, please stop running these ancient... Just as a straw poll, who here is still using Perl 5.8 for their main Perl? Like me. Yeah, four or five people. Yeah, so it's, it's too many people. I use 5.8 for most of our work at, per, at work. Uh, my laptop is running 5.21, but my laptop is <laughs> it's, it's only one man. Um, so yeah, it does support 5.8. Chris. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. So, so uh, the, the point is, if you are concerned about performance, another thing to consider is whether you are using a threaded build of Perl. Most of the time, you do not need Perl with threads. Many vendors ship it with threads compiled in, and that can lead to like a 10 to 20% performance decrease. It's a huge decrease in performance. It's sometimes less. It depends a lot on what you're doing. But if you don't need threads, turn them off. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, if you have role A with role B and uh, the inner one has a requirement, does the outer one have to provide it or can it be punted till it's actually composed? And the answer is, whenever you have requires, it's not required until you make a class out of it. So if you have a bunch of roles and you bring them together, all their requirements go together in that composite role, and it's the class that has to fulfill them. Yes? Yeah, yeah, and then the next question is, well, what if you want to provide the thing that was required in the other role? You can absolutely do that. Yeah, in fact, I often, I often do that. Is a question in the back? No? Any more? Yes? Where can you get the slides? Okay, the slides are here. Um, these slides have been changed very slightly since what is published there. I will probably tweak them a little more because I feel like, uh, well, I, I'm not sure. The ones that are up there are fine. Any changes are trivial. After today, there's a number of non-trivial things I want to change, so probably don't wait for that. Anybody else? Okay, before I let you go, I have strong instructions here on my podium uh, telling me that you, you should rate my talk. Uh, you go on the site. I don't know if it tells me where. It doesn't say. Go onto the OSCON site. Click a number. I think you get to pick between one and five. Um, and what I would, they, they would like you to rate the talk. What I would like is comments. Uh, ratings are fine, but the, you can't react to ratings. If you guys have anything you thought was good or bad or anything, leave a comment. If you don't want to have your name next to it, have a friend leave it. Uh, I don't care. Uh, just give Shirley a note and have her pass it to me anonymously. I always like to hear what people want changed. Okay, thank you very much. I had a lot of fun, and I hope you learned something. <laughs>